the agreement is expected to provide opportunities for businesses in Ghana to export goods to other African countries duty-free and quota-free. But that cost would, 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 would come in the form of reduced cash flow available to private sector to expand. That cost would also come to reduce cash flow, which would affect savings and investment drive of households, individuals, mm -hmm. and all of that. In this same budget, what government is doing with 1D1F is that government also grants them some form of exemption um, for the machinery that they import to set up these businesses. And this leaves some form of capital credit with um, the businesses to enable them to run the businesses. Um, the factories and this will be achieved with increased focus on the establishment of industrial enclaves which will have dedicated and reliable power we will know that part of the reason why our cost of power is very high today is because the kind of PPEs we signed at the time when we went into the energy crisis uh, it didn't really favor as much it made the cost of power very expensive so attempt to renegotiate and bring down the cost of power would definitely help a great deal um, there's also the talk about renewable energy and, and government plans to install about 17 to 90 megawatts of power in the, uh, in the upper west region, uh, solar power in the upper west region. They all add to the quality of energy. And renewable energy at the beginning is very expensive, investment cost is high. But when it's spread over time, it can also. Outlook webinar. The Economic Outlook Webinar is a deluxe flagship program that brings together resources from industry, government, Good morning, everyone. You are warmly welcome to the Deloitte Economic Outlook webinar. The Economic Outlook webinar is a Deloitte flagship program that brings together resources from industry, government, practice, and academia to provide recommendations and share perspective on the budget and policy statement for consideration by government. The theme for this year's event is 2021 budget statement making Ghana a hub for the Africa free trade area. My name is Gloria Boyduku, tax partner responsible for personal tax compliance services, payroll and immigration services, and I'll be your MC for today. Kindly note that the webinar will be recorded and uploaded onto the Deloitte YouTube page. We invite you to participate in the discussion by typing your comments and contributions in the chat box. You can also use the raise hand feature during the Q&A session and you'll be unmuted to ask your question. We greatly appreciate your feedback, for which reason a questionnaire will be shared after today's webinar for you to share your honest feedback for future consideration. Now, without further ado, I'd like to hand over the floor to the country managing partner of Deloitte Ghana, who is our host for today's event, to give his welcome address. Dan, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Gloria, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope we are all well. Uh, let me take this opportunity to specially welcome um, Honorable Alan Chermatin, Minister of Trade and Industry, Honorable Abna Ose Asari, former Deputy Minister of Finance, uh, Mr. Seb Chum Akwabwa, CEO of Association of Ghana Industries, Mr. John Nawa, CEO Ghana Association of Bankers, and uh, Prof. Godfrey Botkin, economist and professor of finance, University of Ghana. Let me also acknowledge and welcome my own people George Ankoma, George is a tax partner and the leader of tax and regulatory services at Deloitte Ghana. Uh, Gloria introduced herself already. Gloria is a tax and regulatory partner. Yao Apialate, financial advisory leader, Deloitte Ghana. 
and I also recognize and welcome all my partners and staff of Deloitte. To my distinguished guests online, we are excited to have you all here with us. The Ghanaian economy, like other economies in the world, has been adversely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Although the global economy is yet to get out of the wounds, most governments are already taking steps towards recovery from the pandemic. The government of Ghana has, over the period of the pandemic, focused on supporting businesses and households through the provision of incentives, interventions, and reliefs. This commitment has been reiterated in the 2021 budget statement and economic policy, which has been that economic revitalization through completion, consolidation, and continuity. As expected, the 2021 budget statement proposals included significant focus on mobilizing revenue to support government increasing expenditure and supporting sectors severely affected by the pandemic through reliefs and government interventions. We at Deloitte, through our shared values, endeavor to lead the way towards recovery, take care of our clients, stakeholders, and collaborate with government and industry for measurable impact as we forge ahead to build a strong new world of business post the pandemic. Our program today looks to capture certain key points from the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, AFTA, and highlight how Ghanaian businesses can position themselves to unlock the potential for growth in the coming years. Key questions bordering our minds are, what opportunities are there? What are the challenges that comes with it? What has government done to address some of these challenges? What do businesses start to gain? Should they take advantage of after? The outcome of our review of today's session is to ensure that we break down the issues for the non-technical reader to understand, to give our own perspective, and to connect also to the business community. In simple and short, we want to make it simple for the average person to understand some of the peculiarities of the budget. Deloitte is ready to engage the business community on some of the issues in the budget, so as to help to forge our ahead as we take the next step. We have therefore assembled people from business, financial sector, government, academia, and finance to discuss this among others. At this point, I want to introduce our keynote speaker, Honorable Alan Martin, Minister of Trade and Industry. Joseph, if you can hear me, please let's hear Alan's background. Alan John Kojo Tremanting is an incumbent Minister of Trade and Industry in Ghana. He is a corporate executive, a diplomat, and an international public servant specializing in global trade issues. Alan has an extensive and distinguished record in international trade, international public policy, enterprise development, politics, and diplomacy. As a cabinet minister and a former presidential candidate, as an ambassador and negotiator, as an international public servant, and as a senior corporate executive in private sector, Alan Tremanting is a graduate in economics from the University of Ghana and also a qualified barrister at law from the Ghana School of Law. Alan is a Hubert Humphrey Fellow at the School of Management of the University of Minnesota under the U.S. Fulbright Fellowship Program. He has served as a member of Council of Governors of the British Executive Service Overseas in the United Kingdom and also as a board member of several other organizations in Ghana. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, it's my singular honor to welcome um, Alan Chemartin um, to the floor. Alan, um, thank you for honoring our invitation. You may now proceed and have the floor to deliver your keynote address. Thank you. Man. Thank you very much. Um, the managing partner, partners, directors, and staff of Deloitte Ghana. Let me start first by expressing my profound gratitude for the invitation extended to me to deliver the keynote speech at this year's Deloitte Economic Dialogue. 
<coughs> on the theme 2021 budget statement making Ghana a hub for the African continental free trade area after. The theme for this dialogue could not have been more appropriate. And I consider it a credit to the leadership of Deloitte Ghana to have convened this uh, particular forum, placing the spotlight on how the programs and policies of government as outlined in the 2021 budget statement can help businesses in Ghana harness the benefits of AFTA. Ladies and gentlemen, the most critical development challenge currently confronting our country is how to deal with the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly from the standpoint of managing the economy in a post-COVID era. In this regard, government has over the last year introduced a number of policy interventions designed to stimulate economic recovery. In particular, the government has provided incentives and reliefs to businesses and households to cushion the impact of the pandemic. The same guess. It is clear, however, that these policy interventions cannot be sustained unless they are underpinned by a medium to long-term strategic framework that is designed to revitalize the economy through increased investments in the productive sectors of the economy, primarily led by the private sector, but facilitated by government. The 2021 budget statement and economic policy provides the foundation for developing such a strategic framework. Ladies and gentlemen, the primary objective of the 2021 budget and medium-term fiscal framework is to implement measures to mitigate the impact of the pandemic with a view to returning the economy to strong and sustainable growth while protecting lives and livelihoods. The focus of the budget and the medium-term plan is to achieve the following broad macroeconomic objectives. One, restore and sustain macroeconomic stability anchored on fiscal discipline and ensuring debt sustainability. Two, return the economy to the fiscal responsibility threshold of 5% fiscal de deficit and a positive primary balance by 2024. Three, implement reforms to increase revenue mobilization and efficiency of public expenditures. Four, revitalize and transform the economy through the implementation of the Ghana COVID-19 Revitalization and Enterprise Support Program, otherwise referred to as CARES. Five, build a robust financial sector to support growth and development. Six, provide a supportive private sector environment for entrepreneurship development and for domestic businesses and foreign direct investment to thrive. And last but not the least, deepen structural reforms to make the machinery of government work more efficiently and effectively to support socio-economic transformation. Distinguished divided guests, the anticipated increase in industrial and agricultural production and productivity arising from the proposed fiscal and monetary interventions by government as outlined in the 2021 budget can only be sustained through enhanced market access for goods that will be produced in Ghana. It is against this background that the African Continental Free Trade Area, AFTA, becomes a critical component of the post-COVID economic recovery agenda for Ghana. As we are all aware, AFTA seeks to consolidate the African continent into a single trading block with a population of about 1.2 billion and an estimated GDP of 3.5 trillion United States dollars. Without doubt, AFTA could be considered as the game changer for the economic transformation of Ghana post our COVID uh, pandemic if we as a country can harness the benefits 
of AFTA, notwithstanding the challenges posed by COVID-19 pandemic. Ghanaian businesses have the opportunity to fast-track recovery by taking full advantage of AFTA. The agreement is expected to provide opportunities for businesses in Ghana to export goods to other African countries duty-free and quota-free, and also without barriers or challenges. It is also worth noting that under the protocol on trading services, which was negotiated as part of the AFTA agreement, Ghanaian businesses can now exploit fully opportunities in Africa in five service sectors, namely construction, financial services, transportation, and then business professional services. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, AFTA is also expected to boost Ghanaian exports, stimulate investments and innovation, foster structural transformation, improve food security, enhance economic growth and export diversification, and above all, provide a fresh impetus and dynamism for the economic integration of Ghana into the African market. There are many benefits that Ghana will derive from effective implementation of the AFTA including better harmonization and coordination of trade between Ghana and other African countries, adding value to Ghana's abundant trade natural resources, and also promoting the diversification of our economy. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the government is clearly aware that these benefits from after will not accrue automatically to businesses in Ghana. It will require a comprehensive program of support for Ghanaian businesses in areas including access to finance, enhancing industrial productive capacity, trade facilitation, developing trade-related infrastructure, and facilitating access to market information. To the credit of the Akufuado-led government, a number of program interventions have already been introduced to support companies in the areas listed above even before the onset of the pandemic. These include the introduction of a financial stimulus package for local industries being implemented with the support of participating financial institutions. The One District, One Factory Initiative, the establishment of industrial parks and special economic zones, the development of small and medium enterprises by establishing 63, 67 business resource centers across the length and breadth of our country to assist business development for small and medium enterprises. The Tema Enterprise Port Expansion Project, the development of the railway network, the construction and rehabilitation of our road network, and last but not the least, the introduction of a new trade facilitation and customs management system, otherwise referred to as Unipass or ICOMS. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all these programs outlined above have been consolidated into a national action plan for boosting intra-African trade under AFTA, which now becomes the blueprint for Ghana in harnessing the benefits of AFTA. But in addition to the above, there are other specific programs and policy interventions that have been outlined in the 2021 budget, which will complement the existing policy interventions that I've uh, just referred to. These include the following. The establishment of the Development Bank of Ghana to improve access to medium to large scale project financing. And secondly, Continue the interest rate subsidy incentive for one district, one factory companies to enhance access to affordable credit. Thirdly, the establishment of a domestic credit rating agency to assist firms with access to capital. Four, the implementation of new initiatives to support the Ghana stock market by helping to attract capital for Ghanaian businesses, including the deepening of the stock exchange 
and partnering with fintechs to bring trading of securities to the doorsteps of the Ghanaian uh, business. Five, suspend income tax stamp payments for small businesses to improve their cash flow, which will increase their working capital and provide an inclusive environment for micro, small, and medium enterprises. Six, waiver of penalty and interest on accumulated tax arrears to reduce cash flow challenges. Seven, support to be provided to commercial farming and plantation to enhance access to agricultural raw materials for processing and value addition. Government will procure agricultural machinery and equipment worth about 30 million US dollars for distribution to farmers to prove to improve mechanization for agriculture. Eight, increase access to affordable and reliable energy for industry. This will be achieved with increased focus on the establishment of industrial enclaves, which will have dedicated and reliable power. And last but not the least, the completion of the Kumasi and, and Tamale airports to improve easy access to the Sahelian countries, particularly within the framework of Africa. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, the 2021 budget statement and economic policy of government outlines the president's program for accelerated recovery from the devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. It explains our plans to emerge stronger by pressing on with economic transformation, strengthening our social impact, and building a sustainable future to create prosperity and equal opportunity for all Ghanaians. We believe that AFTA provides an excellent platform for the realization of these plans. Government will continue to prioritize support to the private sector and entrepreneurship to create jobs and improve incomes by making Ghana a hub for commerce, financial services, and manufacturing in Africa to take full advantage of AFTA. With these opening remarks, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all fruitful deliberations of this year's Deloitte Economic Dialogue. I thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Honorable, and uh, we appreciate uh, your time. Um, we, we were informed you have to be in Parliament uh, this morning um, to actually talk about the budget, um, but you have made time to be with us. Um, so at this point, on behalf of the partners of Deloitte, uh, Ghana, West Africa, and across Africa, we want to especially thank you um, for making time um, to be with us. And I know you have to leave. So what we will do is that if there are any comments or questions that um, have to come in your doorsteps once we are done, we will get them together and we'll get in touch with you and we'll get answers and we'll share with our, our audience. We want to once again thank you for accepting to be the keynote speaker of this fancy. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. So at this point, uh, we want to continue the program um, and I want to invite Yao Apia Latte, who is a financial advisory leader, Dinoy uh, Ghana. Uh, Yao will give us uh, key highlights of the budget statement and then go deeper into some of the simple things that we want the ordinary Ghanaian to hear about the budget statement. And then Yao will help launch um, Deloitte's budget highlight for 2021. Yao, please take over. Thank you very much, Dan, and good morning to uh, you all, my fellow panelists, as well as the larger audience of our clients and then um, people Ghanaians who are listening to us. It's an opportunity for us to discuss one of the projected outcomes of the 2021 budget statement and economic policy of government. 
uh, one of the outcomes of this budget is to position business in Ghana to benefit from the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. Ghana had the privilege and the honor of hosting the headquarters of AFTA. So we have no excuse not to benefit from AFTA. And as the minister rightly uh, intimated, some of the measures have already taken off by government to support business to take advantage of AFTA. I guess that is not the end of it. We have to think and discuss some of the opportunities available for businesses. What are some of the things that business will have to do in Ghana to benefit from after? So that's one of the outcomes of this budget dialogue that we are looking to get after this event. So this discussion will center around it. And then some of the key policy initiatives by government, particularly on the revenue and expenditure side. <clears throat> So I'll go through the highlights uh, briefly with some key points to note ahead of our panel discussion. So we first start with our global economy. I guess our economy is not in a silo. We are operating in a global economy. So it's important that we look at what the market is going to be in the short to medium term. So one of the very interesting development that we foresee in 2021 is the fact that the global economy is going to um, record some uh, significant growth about 5.5 percent as against a 3.5 percent in 2021 of particular importance is a positive growth in advanced economies so advanced economies albeit lower than 2020 growth is going to record a positive growth about 4.3 percent that presents an opportunity for emerging and developing economies like ours that uh, exports our commodities, particularly our traditional commodities like gold, cocoa, oil, and the rest, to advance economies. So we have opportunity to take advantage of, as well as the fact that emerging and developing economies are projected to grow at about 6.3%. In terms of commodity prices, with the exception of uh, cocoa, the rest of the traditional commodities in Ghana, like gold and crude oil, are expected to record progressive increases over the medium term. So whilst uh, cocoa prices are expected to reduce from about 1,775 to about 1,616 uh, by the end of 2024, we are expected to record some progressive increase in crude oil prices from uh, about 41 dollars per barrel to about $54 per barrel. We do know that the spot rate today is higher than this, but this is the projection given the uncertainties that still lingers around us. We do know that uh, prices of uh, gold will also uh, stay at a certain level over the period, but we, uh, we are just projecting that gold prices will also reduce. Uh, over the period of the pandemic, gold price stayed at very high at about $1,900. Now, as we speak, we do expect it to reduce over the medium term because demand will shift to other commodities that, as we recover from the pandemic, will also become necessary. In terms of regional development, I can't overemphasize the points that the minister reiterated. The government has established certain or put in place certain measures, such as having the headquarters in Accra to coordinate after activities. Also, government has held series of stakeholder engagement, including this dialogue, for instance, is supporting the stakeholder engagement on after to help business take advantage of the Africa continental free trade area. If you look at our economy at a glance, and those these are some of the uh, points that were discussed recently after the minister presented the budget statement. Now, in terms of our targets for 2020, we missed, I mean, uh, the main ones, a GDP growth. It was initially projected at 6.8% before uh, we were hit heavily by the pandemic. By the end of the year, our 68 had declined to 0.2%, almost hitting a contraction. In the same way, uh, projected inflation uh, at some point, we revised it to 11%, but we ended the year uh, at about 10.4%. Some marginal improvement upon that. But the others, like our overall budget deficits, we have a fiscal responsibility cap of 5%. We 
we knew we were going to miss that because we were in a crisis, but it worsened from what was projected to be about 11.4% to about 11.7%. So that worsened slightly. The effect of this is that our projected budget deficit is likely to widen, but government is quite optimistic. So we are projecting to return to below our fiscal responsibility cap of below 5% by the end of 2024. So the projected uh, deficit in 2021 is about 10%. We are just hoping and advising government to put in the right, uh, put in place the right measures to ensure that we hit at least this 10% deficit. And then a progressive decline or improvement over the period to about 4% in 2024. We do know that on account of inflation, we have historically maintained below the 10%, which is quite commendable. But last year, we missed that, and we hope we will return to the below 10% threshold. GDP is expected to recover strongly in um, 2021 at about 5%, and at an average of 5% over the next uh, four years, which is commendable, and we hope government to put in place the right measures for that to happen. In terms of... Uh, revenue as you can see and as you notice from the budget that will be presented in detail subsequently in our report uh, government expect to get significant revenue sources or mobilize significant revenue sources from taxation so tax revenue on oil is expected to be the significant contributor of about 53.6 billion uh, ghana cities this will be followed by non-tax oil revenue non-tax revenue non-oil at about 7 billion, and then the others will follow. As we do know, uh, we are not expecting so much from our oil lifting because one, we are not too sure of what the uh, price of oil is going to be, and then that will be discussed subsequently. But government is implementing aggressive measures to mobilize revenue locally. That is commendable, but of course, it has some risk that you will note and then we point out to government so that at least we do not have a counterproductive policy. Going forward, this particular year, 2021, we are for the first time over so many decades that I can remember, interest payment is going to be the first significant expenditure over compensation. Historically, compensation has remained number one. For the first time in so many years, interest payment is going to be about 32% of government total expenditure for 2021, as against 27% for compensation. That is a trigger, and a trigger of the fact that we have rising debt levels, debt levels that are coming at expensive rates as opposed to concessionary rates. And that's a call on government to look at our debt management strategy and then put in the right mechanism so that we will reverse this because our interest payment has ballooned and it's now the first significant expenditure for government in 2021. In terms of our anticipation, our expectation from crude oil, we expect to make some heavy lifting this year. Um, in, in last year, because of the pandemic, the lifting was slightly lower than expected, but this year we're going to make some heavy lifting. Government is using a benchmark price about 54% which um, relatively compared to what the spot, right, uh, spot price is today, it's lower. But if you look at what the World Bank is projecting, World Bank is projecting uh, crude oil prices to be at an average of 44%. But government is projecting about 54%. That's about $11, uh, $54. So about $11 above what the World Bank projects. In the event that crude oil prices drop below government projection, we are likely to miss our revenue target for, uh, from oil. But if we are able to achieve even more than what government projects, then we are going to get some uh, upsides in revenue from oil. In terms of our debt, as uh, it's always been the debate, our debt GDP ratio from the year 2016 to date, raising from 56%, to 76 percent that is a worrying trend and for a fact we need to act now and the time to act is now so going forward we still foresee some kind of borrowing on both the local and then international markets our advice is that the international market particularly from the capital market is relatively expensive 
which is why our interest for maintenance has ballooned. So can we diversify our borrowing sources? Can we look at other sources that are relatively cheaper if they are? And then also, in addition to that, can we also take advantage of the DSI, the Debt Suspension Initiative, initiated by the G20 countries to support countries that owe these countries to restructure their debt? That gives us some relief, at least in the short to medium term. Also, borrowing on the local front, likely to crowd out the private sector in uh, borrowing. So we're asking government to be cautious as it seeks to borrow from the local market. The adverse impact of COVID cannot be overemphasized and cannot be described in any term as we've always projected it. We have had reduction in wages. We've had reduction in working hours. We've had employees laid off about 42,000 employees as recorded. Reduction in wages about 26%. These are worrying trends. And I think that even on account of death, in Ghana, we've recorded about 725 deaths as a result of COVID. And then globally, we have about 2.7. And the number is increasing, hitting the 3 million mark. That, of course, is something that we are all concerned about. We've had impact on various sectors, particularly the hospitality industry and the likes, agribusinesses. And we do know that government has some policies or measures to alleviate the impact of COVID on the Ghanaian economy. One of the flagship programs that is supposed to help us do that is the Obatampa Ghana Cares Program. This is the second phase of it, as in the medium term phase, where government expects a contribution of about 70% from the private sector and development partners, and government contribute about 30% of that, about 30 billion of that, to support in areas like establishing a regional hub, like what we have in AFTA, support commercial farming, build Ghana's uh, light manufacturing sector, and the likes. I mean, these are very good initiatives. We do expect government to implement them to the letter. If we do have such policies on paper and they are not implemented, we do not get benefit of those. So we do we advise government that in as much as we have very good policies outlined in the budget, uh, by the end of a year or two, we should have some of these things see the light of day. Then we also get the benefit of that. The year of roads, as we do know, we have some expressways that have been on the drawing board for years. We have spoken about dualization of Accra Kumasi Highway and it's been there for over a decade. That has been on paper for a long time. We do expect government to uh, accelerate the process of bringing that to fruition. Also, Accra, Tema Motorway, we do know uh, that it's been announced that we want to do uh, dual carriage, uh, eight lanes, and all of that. We've heard all the stories. But we do have it uh, mentioned here that reconstruction and upgrade of Accra, Tema Motorway, um, to get a benefit of uh, this interregional um, commuting and then trade that uh, happens through that uh, lane. Review of existing toll road, uh, I guess that point cannot also be overemphasized. The reason why we've had challenges implementing some of these PPP projects on road uh, has been the fact that if you look at the numbers or the figures, uh, they are not bankable to potential investors because our toll roads are not reflective of the capital cost or the capital outlay required to do, let's say, dualization of Accra Kumasi Highway requires millions of dollars to do that. And how much are you going to get in tolls to be able to recover that over a period of about 10, 15 to 20 years? So if you review our toll roads, that would be very helpful and making projects like that bankable. Let's go to the taxes. Uh, that's a key area that has been of concern. Government has been very particular about that, trying to mobilize revenue from taxes. So for the first one we have here is increase in NHIR by one percentage point. So NHIR that you had at 2.5% is now at 3.5%. But flat rate scheme from 3% to 4%. We've got sanitation and pollution levy at 10 pesos at the pump per liter. Also at the pump is energy sector recovery levy at 20 pesos. And then for the banking sector, we're going to have an introduction of financial sector cleanup levy of about 5% on profit before tax of banks. This is of a particular concern because we have 
national fiscal stabilization levy of 5%. So effectively, profit before taxes of banks are going up by 10%. And uh, that's uh, something that the uh, Bankers Association have raised and have raised concerns about. The taxes that I mentioned before, the NHIL, the uh, pollution tax and the rest, are all indirect taxes. You have potential of being passed on to the end consumer, increasing the price of goods and services, and then we, uh, the end consumers, paying for them. On the flip side, government has decided to provide some relief uh, or rebate for businesses. So the first one is 30% rebates for businesses that were hit heavily by the pandemic. The hotels, the restaurant, the education sector, entertainment, travel and tour, and the likes. Now, the concern that has been raised by players in that industry is that the tax rebate is on the output. On the assumption that they are making profits, that's where you get the benefit of this rebate. What they would have loved to see is on the inputs. Because as they are struggling, they are not likely to report profit in the short term maybe the medium term so on the output side the cost of getting the business back on track what benefits can government also look at giving to this industry that would be very helpful government has suspended quarterly income tax for small businesses using the income tax stamp suspension of vehicle income tax for truck trusts and taxis they will be very happy to hear this story and then waiver of interest and penalties on outstanding tax liabilities and this i guess a lot of businesses to take advantage of. So outstanding tax liabilities up to December 2020, if you just work voluntarily to go and pay, sometimes the interest and penalties are so punitive that that's a disincentive for you to pay. It's an opportunity for you to take advantage of and pay any outstanding taxes up to December 2020. Then permanent capital gains tax exemption for uh, investment on the Ghana Stock Exchange. We have to see a lot of activity on our a local or uh, domestic stock market and that's an opportunity for us to also take advantage of now one critical thing and revenue mobilizer is the tax identification number 10 that we've, we all have is now going to be replaced with the ghana card unique identification number so a lot of us do have the ghana card now so that's going to be your unique tax identification number as well the advice to government is that it's one thing registering people to have tax identification numbers or Ghana unique identification numbers. That has to be translated to revenue generation. People had 10 numbers, but they were not filing their returns or they were not paying taxes. So in the same way, we should have this translated into revenue generation. An interesting area is the spot betting area. Government is looking at making some money from that as well by international policy to regulate that market. We have some of these proposals outlined in our detailed budget document, and we do hope that this is just a teaser for the discussion and the debate as we go forward. Thank you very much. Now, we will switch straight to our panel discussions. At some point, we will uh, share the barcode for our budget document, a detailed budget document with our views and commentary, which is quite uh, comprehensive for you to read over uh, when you are less busy but uh, before we share the barcode at some point during the um, this uh, dialogue um, we will just switch straight to our panel discussion and then uh, so at this stage you like to introduce the members of our panel Honorable Mrs. Abna Osei Esari is a banker and a chartered accountant. Abna has served as a member of parliament since January 7, 2013, representing the people of Etiwa East in the Eastern Region. Prior to entering parliament, Honorable Abna Osei Esari worked as an assistant director for the New York University in Ghana between the period of 2004 and 2007, and also as a customer team leader 2007 to 2009, as a sales dealer in Treasury Department 2009 to 2012, both at the Barclays Bank Ghana Limited. She is an alumni of the University of Ghana and runs an NGO, the Water Book Foundation, which supports brilliant but needy students with education. She is a member of the Association of the Chartered Certified Accountant and has a certificate in dealing from ACI, Financial Market Association. Thank you very much. So, Honorable Abna Osei Asari, you are welcome. Yeah, you probably uh, want to show your video, you see your face. OK. 
Okay, honorable. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we can see you. Uh, so thank you very much for making time. Uh, so our next member of the panel. George Ankuma is a tax and legal partner at Deloitte Ghana. With over 20 years experience in serving clients by providing them with the entire spectrum of tax service. His clients include several multinational companies who are global employers with substantial expert population worldwide. George's professional career started with Ghana Revenue Authority, where he worked for over eight years and rose to the level of Principal Inspector of Taxes. George is a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountant Ghana and a Chartered Tax Practitioner with the Chartered Institute of Taxation Ghana. He holds a Master's Degree in Finance from the Lancaster University, UK. Thank you very much, our tax experts, Mr. Jordan Kuma. You're welcome. We would like to see you. Thank George, you, Mr. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, so thank, thank you very you. much, George. Thank so you. we go to our next member of the panel. Professor Godfred A. Boping is an economist and a professor of finance. He earned his Doctor of Philosophy PhD in Economics from Graduate School of Economics, Osaka University, Japan, Master of Philosophy degree in Finance, and Bachelor of Administration in Accounting with First Class Honors from the University of Ghana. Professor Boping combined three broad disciplines of Accounting, Finance, and Economics, and the interrelation between them in his teaching and research that uniquely distinguish his output. In the last five years, his research and advocacy has focused more on pro poor programs, inclusive growth, sustainable development, inequality, and climate change issues. He has over 40 articles in the High Impact Journal, in addition to edited conference proceedings, edited books, and book chapters to his credit. He has extensive experience in consulting for industries, civil society organizations, and government institutions. Professor Bopin enjoys studying the Bible and preaching the gospel in rural areas. Thank you very much, Paul. You are welcome, one of our regular panelists. Uh, we are very pleased to have you join us today, too. Thank you very much, and I'm very happy to be here and to be with the, uh, the, the other panelists and your guests. It's really a privilege. Thank you. I'm very grateful. Thank you very much, Bob. Okay, so our next... John Owa is the CEO of Ghana Association of Bankers. John is a fellow of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants, UK, with several years of post-qualification experience and many years of senior management experience. He holds a Bachelor of Commerce degree from the University of Cape Coast, Ghana, with a first-class honor, MBA from Oxford Brokers University, UK, and several years of progressively responsible work experience, including financial control, credit control, financial accounting, business partnering, business analysis and corporate strategy. As CEO of Universal Merchant Bank, John championed the implementation of the institutional renewal program in the then corporate turnaround of the bank. John has served in various strategic leadership capacities for the United Bank of Africa, Barclays Bank, now APSA, EcoBank, Capital Bank and GCB Bank Limited. Thank you very much. John, you are welcome. Hello, good morning to fellow panelists and to participants. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for accepting our invitation. We are very much privileged to have you. Mr. Sechu Makoba is the CEO of the Association of Ghana Industry. He has a degree in economics and a master's degree in business administration. Set is a business development consultant by profession and was previously the coordinator of the INET program, a Dutch government organization that supports migrant entrepreneurs in the Netherlands to set up businesses in Ghana. Said, during his tenure as CEO of the AGI, has managed a number of developmental projects, including Government of Ghana, World Bank, UNID Industrial Subcontracting, and Partnership Exchange Project. Since 2011, he has been leading the AGI team on policy advocacy, provision of business development service for the team members, and head the entire directorate of the association, including six regional branches. He coordinates the activities of the 22 different business sectors under the AGI membership. Right. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us today as well, one of our regular panelists. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and uh, thank you. I hope we'll have a good discussion. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. So, that's it. So, thank you very much, um, all of you, uh, for making time for this discussion. So, we can't uh, move away from our interesting after discussion i guess we'll do a first round of discussion on after but um i'll start with honorable uh abuna Ose asari mp for etiwa east as well and a former deputy minister of finance so the first uh, question that i would like to ask you 
is whether you believe the 2021 budget statement and economic policy provided sufficient support for businesses to take advantage of the Africa continental free trade. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to be part of this dialogue uh, because I have no to have a government focus to yeah. increase engagement with the private sector, industry players, academia, and to promote a private sector driven economy and to be facilitated by governments. And um, after listening to the Honorable Minister for Trade and yourself, we have no doubts as to um, the kind of things in the budget that is sufficient enough to help us um, take advantage of after to improve on our trade um, our trade environment and as well as um, spare economic goods. It is um, a hope that um, we will uh, increase growth from the small policy was 0.9% to 5% of GDP uh, by the end of uh, 20, uh, 20, 2021. And we believe that there's a private sector that should spare this growth uh, as our government facilitates it. Our government should also create an living environment for the private sector to take advantage of this and then um, to get involved and to help us in, and go to where, go, to where we want to go. So um, what I will say is that um, when you look at um, the 2021 budget, we have spelled out a couple of things that uh, we believe uh, can help us. One, like the minister mentioned, that the Ministry of Trade uh, has engaged stakeholders, and together they have um, come up with uh, some plan of action. And that plan of action also allowed government to fit in there to see what government can do. One, like I said, in, in creating the living environment. Uh, you, you, can't, you can't have um, a living environment without access to credits. Remember, one thing that um, the minister mentioned was access to credit for um, some of um, our private sector developers. And where government is, in, um, as we share, some form of policy where we try to absorb some of the interest or the cost of um, borrowing that these businesses um, need. And then secondly, uh, my own friend, uh, Johnny Wua, will attest to that fact that uh, government had to come in to bail out hugely the financial sector. Cannot uh, create an, an, an enabling environment without the involvement of the financial sector. Government had to invest into one billion, and even that is not the final cost of um, the bailout of the whole financial sector. But currently, as we speak, we have seen a robust uh, financial sector that is ready I mean, to help the private sector um, thrive, um, to, um, to create an environment, to also help them to grow. And then also, government through uh, the Bank of Ghana came out with policies that um, we are still continuing so that um, even though the COVID-19 pandemic hasn't eased, we believe that as we continue these policies, policies from government side and um, Bank of Ghana, it can help um, sustain the financial sector because we need the financial sector to enable us uh, a move on again in this same budget. What government is doing with 1D1F is that governments also grants them some form of exemption um, for the machinery that they import to set up these businesses, and this leaves some form of capital credits with um, the businesses to enable them run the businesses, um, um, the factories, and the, the, yes, the, the factories. Again, let us also look at. Uh, you, you cannot create a living environment without looking at access to labor. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the policy initiatives of this government is to continue with the free SHS. The free SHS already has um, enabled our 1.2 million Ghanaians to have access to some a minimum level of education because um, as we want to improve trading, we also need to think about the labor that we are going to use and how this, um, the labor... Um, can train this labor and build their capacity to also um, help uh, the businesses to take advantage of this. So government in this budget is funding free SHS to the tune of 1.9 billion and to help in this area to provide the human resource that the, uh, the, the country needs 
Again, we look at the NAPU Nation Builder Scope. Gavin is also providing about 700 million in this regard to boost um, the quality or the capacity of labor. Uh, the NAPU um, people are um, graduates who have completed tertiary education but don't have the requisite experience to enable them to find um, jobs, permanent jobs. So Gavin is also creating this enabling environment, building their capacity. Because, um, just as you need credit, you also need the labor and the labor should be some of some kind of quality. And so yeah. government is also funding to the team of about 700 million in this um, area. Again, when you look at our land acquisition system in this uh, country, uh, before, um, uh, we've, had, we've, got, we've had to go through a, a series of um, reforms yeah. to make access to land for businesses to try and um, to get to where we are now. And in this budget, when you look at paragraph 665, the government has come out with um, a digitization of our land administration um, to, to bring some transparency and make it very, very easy for businesses to acquire land I mean, to help in this regard. And again, when you look in the budget, government is not just um, providing um, access to all these things. Government is also asking that just as uh, we are giving you all these things, we are trying very hard to create a living environment you also have to help us. That is the business community, the citizens at large, at large you also have to help us. In that, um, this is where we are now. We are hoping to spend about 113.8 billion in expenditure alone. And then we are hoping to raise 72 billion Ghana cities as revenue. And in between that, there's the deficit of 41 billion Ghana cities. Yeah. Government says, I want to create a living environment. I want to help the private sector thrive. So I do not want to um, resort to just borrowing to fund um, these gaps. But I also want um, all of us to help me close the gap so that um, when we will be able to leave some resources there for the private sector to also um, go in for. And at the same time, we will also be able to reduce. You spoke about um, the interest that we are paying for and the loans that we have borrowed for 2021, and that's about 35 um, billion, and yeah. it's way above what we are paying for compensation. It is true. And these are some of the things that we need to check. So in government creating this enabling environment, government is also asking that can the private sector, can the citizens also help me raise this revenue of 72 billion? Otherwise, when I'm not able to raise this, I would have to resort to some form of borrowing, and that will also crowd out um, um, the financial space the for, private. Private, for, for the private sector. And so government is asking that one, uh, you help us with a 10% levy on sanitation and pollution, and then we increase the NHIL and the flat, flat rates by one percentage point each. And so this is what government is also um, asking in this okay. budget. Again, and finally, okay. government has also put the safety measures in place because you cannot have um, a private sector um, engage in the private sector. You want the private sector to do well and everything and, and they don't have security. So government has funded so much in the 2021 budget in terms of increasing our security um, people and the security borders and increasing the security expenditure and um, so that businesses will be secured and have their peace of mind to go about um, their business. So we can find all these things in the 2021 budget and I think government is really ready to partner the private sector to see to way that this five percent of GDP group that we are all aspiring to um, to achieve can be achieved together and with all of us. Okay, thank you very much, Honorable uh, Abna Osea sorry. Uh, that was very instructive and insightful from the budget. Uh, so we we'll go to the private sector man. Um Mr Seth Chumakwa, CEO of AGI. So the first question for you is, we've known that uh, historically the AGI has raised concerns about cost of power and lack of access to finance and, and the rest. Are some of the challenges hindering uh, your businesses in Ghana? And if we seek to take advantage of after, some of these um, challenges will have to be addressed. So maybe from your reading of the budgets, 
do you uh, see uh, some of these challenges that you've raised or some of these concerns that you've raised uh, in the past being addressed? Uh, your take on that. Well, thank you very much. Yes. Um, in the budget, I think, as has been mentioned by the for, uh, Minister for Trade and Industry and, and Honorable uh, sorry, uh, there are a lot of measures and, and, and policies that are in the budget that seem to be very supportive of industrial development. For example, if you take the idea of establishing a development bank, and the whole idea is that it should enhance access to medium to long term capital at a cheaper rate, because a typical development bank provides funding at a concessionary rate or at a rate that is affordable by industry. So that is really pro industry and that is quite positive and it will help address the cost of finance and also access to finance especially for industrial development um on the power side i mean there are several challenges that we have as industry and we've always been talking about it and relating it to cfta it is key that we become competitive on the power side uh, energy costs is a major cost component of any cost structure of uh, any industry in, in the case of the uh, metal industry for example cost of power will consider about 30 percent of their cost of production so if your cost of power is high it makes you very uncompetitive and here we are talking about competitiveness because we are talking cfta it's about you being able to export your goods to the african zone and then also open your market for countries in africa or companies in other african countries to export to your country so if you are not competitive then you have a challenge you may lose your own market and you'll be able to grab part of the market out there and therefore, competitiveness in terms of your products and in terms of uh, your cost or price of your product is key. If cost of power is that expensive in Ghana, how does that make us competitive? In this budget, in this budget, we heard of the attempt to do uh, further negotiations. They talked about the third round negotiations of the power purchase agreements. And we know that part of the reason why our cost of power is very high today is because the kind of PPEs we signed at the time when we went into the energy crisis, uh, it didn't really favor as much. It made the cost of power very expensive. So attempt to renegotiate and bring down the cost of power would definitely help a great deal. Um, there's also the talk about renewable energy and, and government plans to install about 17 to 90 megawatts of power in the, uh, in the upper west region, uh, solar power in the upper west region. They all add to the quality of energy and renewable energy at the beginning is very expensive, investment cost is high, but when you spread over time, it can also help reduce costs. So that is also positive. So the renegotiation is good. The introduction of renewable energy cost, and renewable energy into the energy mix is good. It will help reduce cost of power. But there's an aspect I want to mention, which for me is very important. That's about the crop subsidy. A situation where industry is made to pay more than residential users. You are virtually passing on some of the costs of energy on the residential industry to uh, residential users to industry. And we are talking of competitiveness within after. When you go to other African countries, in Cote d'Ivoire, for example, energy costs to industry is way cheaper than residential users. So effort is actually made to do energy conservation. So because cost to uh, the residential users is high, they have a lot of energy conservation measures and everybody tries to conserve energy. They make efficient use of energy because you pay for it. In, Kodi, in, in Togo, when they buy power even from Ghana, the power that comes from Ghana is directed at industry. It's not directed at uh, consumers. Okay. So the difference between us and some of these countries is that priority is given to industrial usage of power and they make it cheaper for industries. So if you are talking of continental free trade agreements, where industries are going to be cited within Africa and be exporting to the rest of Africa, then it would gonna be the best option for such industries because your cost of power is high. What you want to do is to have a very attractive and business environment. Cost of doing business is lower. Then it attracts industries here. And then those that are already here, they produce at a competitive price. So Ghana has to look at that aspect. It is so critical that if you want to be competitive within CFTA, our cost of production must come down. And energy being a major cost of it, we make sure that we don't ask industry to subsidize residential users. Even if you look at our power distribution system, it is all geared towards residential. Recent efforts by government at extending energy, we have no problem with it. 
But if you look at it, the most of the investment that are going to our energy spread is going to the residential areas. The medical we established in the north, the rural electrification project, all of it, all the investment we are making there, it is basically targeted at getting more access to energy by everybody. We have no problem with that, but that should be that should not be at the expense of industrial uses. If you look at the costing of our energy types, a lot of it comes from the fact that we are spreading around and we are asking industry to subsidize for residential uses. When energy when we started consuming electricity in, in this country, it was basically for industry when VACO was established and all that. And therefore, industrial usage was way higher than residential. Today, it's about 50 50. Or even if uh, the residential use are even become more than, than, than industry usage. So, what do you ask industry to subsidize residential? We really need to look at it. In this budget, the only area that I've seen is what I've mentioned. Some efforts in, in, in the areas of uh, power purchase agreement and all to all help. But let's look at the issue of crop subsidy uh, so that we support industry development. The other aspects that have been mentioned, you know, everything that helps to reduce cost of doing business and cost of production, indirectly helps you to become competitive so that you can export to the African market. So all the other measures that government has tried to put in place in this budget, indirectly will help. But let's be more direct in some of the things that we we, we, we we're talking about. The Minister for Trade mentioned some of the areas, such as the effort to support or subsidize interest costs on 1D1F factors. For me, that is important. It is helping to reduce cost of capital to industries that are being established under the 1D1F. And it is going to be continuing and it's mentioned in the budget. It's also very welcoming. The only thing is that how do we ensure that we spread it such that a lot more companies have access to this facility. Because right now, everything is left to the banks. The banks decide which companies to deal with. Uh, of course, it makes sense because there's a risk on them. However, how many banks are involved? How many businesses are getting access to this facility and getting it subsidized so that we can spread the industries? When we say one district to one factory, it doesn't mean one factory, one district. You can actually have multiples of factories in, the, factories in a particular district. And therefore, the effort at industrialization should be aiming at all these. I think we should have a targeted approach and the budget is giving good pointers, but the implementation of some of these is critical to make sure that industry will really benefit from this. Okay, so thank you very much, sir. Um, so, Honorable Abna Ose, there's a question for you. I'll read it, so maybe you take notes, and then at some point, I will come back to you for you to respond. So, I want to find out from the Honorable uh, Abna, government position on this year's minimum wage and increment in salary. So what's government position on this year's minimum wage and increment in salary? So please, John, so after we open businesses in Ghana to increase their um, currency risk and also as they export to other markets, you are likely to get the benefit of Forex. Now the question I'll, I have for you is, what is the banking sector doing generally to support businesses drive the after agenda in ghana how do we get businesses to benefit from after from the banking side thank you very much um, you all know as for the benefits and opportunities in after uh, i think it's been very well amplified by the honorable trade minister and my sister Abna, who has also taken us to uh, what government is doing in that direction um, aside that as banks we have also been involved um, in, in the background working with the Ministry of Trade um, on setting up some form of, if I should put it, as a ground rules for a engagement uh, to enable companies and uh, a business corp uh, corporate Ghana to take advantage of what we see as the benefits or opportunities uh, within the uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement. Uh, it goes beyond that. You raise the issue of uh, introduction of um, FX risk. Yes, that is, that is key. And that is why banks have been involved at the initial stages because we need to also begin engaging our customers about the products that are available to mitigate the risk imposed by or posed by uh, the, the currency differentials um, as we move outside the shores of the Ghana. We're not going to earn only CDs and dollars. We are going to be earning um, Kwacha, Naira, and Square uh, and the like. But banks are products that we can help um, to hedge against volatilities um, um, in these currencies 
so that business business community will have some form of certainty and can plan adequately for their for their earnings. Um, when the uh, various work streams were set, I know that there were banks that were involved um, 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 towards the formation of a national response and the coordination of it. So we have actively been in, involved um, right through the uh, planning stage to the point where we are at the moment. So as an industry, we are very much on board. Um, what we are waiting for is if there are any other opportunities or avenues that government would like to open up to the banking sector so we can also tap in. And I believe the setup of the uh, development bank is one key development that, has, that is going to happen, which will also provide a sense of long-term capital for um, uh, uh, our business people. Uh, as I sit here, I'm on the committee that is undertaking the search um, for the uh, executives and board members of the uh, development bank. So if you look at the approach government has taken in coming out with the development bank, it is not one that is uh, saying as a political institution, it's going to be a national institution that is going to drive uh, um, private sector involvement in financial inclusion in a more uh, a deeper sense. And banks will be partnering them because they are not going to work directly and interfacing directly with customers. So banks will be working with them to be uh, participants within the infrastructure to help them execute on their long-term financing mandate. So in the nutshell, banks are very well grounded. And as you said and repeated time and again, we have stronger banks and we are very prepared to assist. And what we need is the support to enable us to do the best that we can. Okay. Thank you very much, John. Um, so, Honorable, I'll now come back to you for you to respond to your question. I'll just uh, finish the first round of questions. Um, I guess you have also been talking about AFTA for a long time. And I guess some of these points that we have here, you are very familiar with them. So, yeah. do you believe government is doing enough? Uh, developing the human resource capacity. Uh, of course, you are in academia. Uh, for us to take advantage of the opportunity that uh, AFTA provides for us as a country, because it's a bigger African market, a bigger African economy, not just Ghana. So are we uh, building capacity? Are we developing our human resources to take advantage of after? All right, thank you. Uh, good morning to all our participants and my other panelists. Um, I think um, um, the question is, um, it's, it's interesting. Uh, government will be doing its best. Whether that is enough is another thing altogether. Uh, I think within the constraints, and all of that. And if it comes to building uh, or developing human resources, um, it doesn't rest solely with government also. And, uh, it's more also about the, the partnership and the necessary platform that government creates through the institutional arrangements that are supposed to help develop uh, human capital. So that, that is very, very important. And I think that um, that recognition is there. That recognition is there. And I think what going forward, what we have to do is to be able to diffuse this whole EFCFTA and the protocols through our educational curriculum development as well to be able to build ownership and, 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 and internalize it, then we can run with it because it's very, very important. And, and we have to be able to then highlight the, the, the various protocols under the EFCFTA because, it's, it, because EFCFTA has implications for labor market outcome. Okay, it has implications mm -hmm. for export of skills and all of that. So, so if you look at it broadly, and so far we have only focused on certain aspects, but if you look at the entire protocols and all of that, you realize that it goes beyond just exporting tomatoes to Burkina Faso and all of that. So, so going for what we have to do uh, uh, is to be able to um, uh, infuse the ASCFT and its protocols into the tertiary educational framework mm -hmm. to guide leadership and then align skills. That would be very, very important. Okay. But more, more importantly, whilst we look at this, what is key is for us to, you see, in this country, we have been talking about something, and, and I don't quite understand that. We, for the past three, five years, we've been talking about enabling environment. And the question is, in our mind as a country, for broadly, what is it that constitutes enabling environment? And how do we track? And how do we measure our progress? We, we, we have to be able to settle on that. So if we, if we sit here, for last year we talked about enabling environment. 
two years ago we talked about enabling environment how do we measure our progress next year we'll come and sit here and again talk about enabling environment so the question is it, 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 broadly what is it that represent enabling environment and and, and and how do we codify that to represent our broad understanding of business environment which would then also include human capital development Okay, we have to we have to be able to sort out that baseline. Other than that, I, I'm not too sure we'll be making progress. For instance, we've been talking about interest rate coming down. At what level of interest rate and maturity tenure that we would we say it constitute enabling environment? Environment, yeah. At what energy cost level can we say it's supportive to industries to be able to take advantage of AFCFTA? Mm -hmm. What at what level of skill? Okay, and reskilling and upskilling, and, and so that we can el e e eliminate uh, skill redundancies and overlaps that would enable us to take advantage of AFCFT. We have to be able to, we have to be able to, to do that. Then we can measure our progress. Then mm -hmm. we are working towards that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for instance, uh, uh, if we are saying that rates are coming down, but it's not, it's not only restrictions. Okay, the maturity tenure also defines the affordability also. Okay, mm -hmm. so if you have rates that are still, we know that we've missed progress, but <laughs> rates are still above 20%. Mm -hmm. Does that constitute enabling? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is it that will constitute enabling? And uh, so we have to look at that broadly. Then we are working towards that. Then that would also inform in, te in terms of program development admissions to align that skill set. Okay, mm -hmm. but... Ghana has an advantage here, even within West Africa, in terms of a uh, 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 skill gap within, within West Africa. So what it means is, is that even though that might have not, uh, wouldn't have started that, but we should be working towards a sporting skill set, mm -hmm. okay, to fill the critical skill gaps within the continent. Yes. Either in the area of medicine, medical mm -hmm. doctors, or whatever and all of that, because if we, we, we can do that. We can do that. And that would also require the necessary support. Support. So we have to be able to have a certain framework that we are working towards. And I was happy the Honorable Minister talked about a, a strategy that they are coming out with. It's very, very important. Then we all know how we all feed into that. But we've also talked about other good things. Look, in this country, we have never, we don't have problems with good intentions captured in good documents. Mm -hmm. it's in the implementation process that we undo the good intentions that mm -hmm. were cap capitalized in, in, in the formative stage. Mm -hmm. And I'll, 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 I'll tell you why. We had energy sector crisis. In our attempt to resolve the energy sector crisis, we created a black hole in our financial landscape. So we are talking about energy sector excess capacity areas that would, would, would go in excess of $12 billion by 2023. Wow. That is not wow. efficiency. Wow. Then we walked into financial sector crisis. In our attempt to resolve the financial sector crisis, it has, it has also manifested explicitly in debt formation. Mm -hmm. And now we have to pay that also. Then mm -hmm. the, pandemic, the pandemic has also come. So if we continue along this path, then, then, then it's more like um, a cycle, sort of. And we have to be able to have that real commitment because AFC, FTA, and eight benefits are theoretical. Mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. theoretical the, the rest of the work are, it represent work to be done to translate that into actual in a certain concrete manner and i think i think we are not there yet okay. we are not yet, there yet. Yeah, thank, thank you very much prof i think that the, your points about having a definite uh, kpis or benchmark yes. to measure whatever you are working towards to create the enabling environment so if you go to other countries you are able to benchmark the interest rates for particular industry that if you are learning to agriculture this is the benchmark rates if you are looking for house to rent this is the benchmark rent they have what we call the cap rate here you can for the same two bedroom house someone will pay like three times or two times as much yeah. there is no indicator to measure like you said enabling environment uh, in other places you can measure end user time for the cost of power that industries are paying and that's a benchmark across board so if you do not have some of these uh, benchmarks defined and then clearly outlined, you have the enabling environment, but as whether you're making progress or not, uh, it's something that you cannot measure. 
And that's a very good point. Relative. I think it's well It's known. going to be relative. Your enabling environment may be different from how government sees it. It may be different from how private sector sees it mm -hmm. and all of that. And that is going to create a whole lot of confusion yeah. where government says, we have done well. And you say, you haven't done well. <laughs> but we have to be able to have some kind of broad consensus yeah. that we are all working towards. Thank yes. you. Good point. Good point. Okay, so tax expert, George. Um, so, George, um, the idea of after, of course, is to take out uh, removal of tariff and all manner of trade restrictions. So, if we have signed to after, of course, at some point, you realize some countries were not uh, ready to sign because they were looking at the cost and benefit. Now, you sign out onto it, you are likely to lose some tariffs because some goods that will come in with some import duties or levies on them now will come through uh, for free or something very insignificant. So how do you advise governments to um, find a way that the after thing does not become counterproductive, but we are able to compensate for the loss revenue through the loss of uh, levies and then uh, import duties and stuff like that? Yeah. Thank you, Yael. And um, yes, it is true that with government signing on to AFTA, there is that likelihood that we will have reduction in tariff revenue um, as far as Ghana is concerned. But then we have to look at the broader picture. What is in it for us? As far as AFTA is concerned, you realize that Ghana then have, or businesses in Ghana then have opportunity to serve a bigger market. This then gives businesses the opportunity to grow. So you can then look at forming partnerships with other people just to be able to ensure that you are being able to serve that bigger market. We are talking of uh, business or market population of about 1.2 billion uh, people with a GDP of about 3.5 trillion USD. And so this is an opportunity for businesses, and I think that the Honorable Minister, uh, both ministers um, uh, have mentioned that initiatives that government has taken as far as supporting businesses are concerned, including interest rate support and all that. So it is for businesses to take advantage of this to expand their, their network. And once this is happening, what then is the result? The result is that there is more revenue or more um, growth in the business. There is opportunity for more employment. And then people will have more disposable income. And government can get its tax revenue from this um, efforts by businesses. We are also fortunate to have the headquarters here in Ghana. And for that matter, businesses have the opportunity to consult more with the secretariat to be able to get guidance on what um, advantages they can take as far as the after uh, is concerned. But then we should also note that the tax revenue will not just fall in without any effort being taken by government. Government will have to go the extra mile to be able to ensure that in as much as we may be losing um, uh, revenue from the tariff side, uh, we should also strengthen the tax compliance side so that as businesses expand, um, there is opportunity for uh, more revenue to come in. There has been talk around digitizing the tax compliance uh, regime. To what extent has this been done? And I think that government will have to ensure that a lot of effort, efforts are being put in um, to, to digitize the, the tax compliance regime so that mm -hmm. um, a lot of revenue can come in. It will also ensure that then the linkages within the system as far as tax revenue utilization is concerned is, is also reduced, which in itself um, enhances government revenue. So you will end up uh, possibly having a reduction in the tariff side, but significantly you are going to make gains as far as the business economy is concerned because the market is now big and businesses are now going to expand onto this market to do uh, make more, more profit for which you can also get uh, your tax revenue because without the businesses making um, enough revenue, there's nothing to tax. But then if the business are growing, there is more employment opportunities, then yeah. it means that government can also rub in some tax revenue without necessarily increasing tax rates. Yes, certainly. Right. So good points, George. I think those are very good points that uh, worth noting. Uh, so Honorable, 
uh, I'll come back to you with the question that uh, was asked uh, by one of our participants. So I think the person who would want to know government's take on um, the minimum wage and what's your take on increments in wages. This question has been asked over and over and again because <laughs> I know workers are concerned. But um, for workers um, in the public sector, um, one thing that uh, you can bang their hopes on is that in the public sector, there's job security. Um, throughout um, 2020, all the agreements that government entered into with the public sector workers were fulfilled. And I can assure them that um, it will be the same for 2021. 2021, all we are saying is that let's look at the current environment in which we find ourselves in now. There are so many um, adjustments and compromises that we all have to um, undertake to see to it that at the end of the day, jobs are sustained, government is able to pay um, workers, and the economy also grows. Come April 2021, what we usually do is um, the government, employers, and labor we sit to discuss um, base pay as well as the minimum wage. And so um, come April 2021, this is what we are going to do. Um, and, uh, but I think we should also have this at the back of our mind that we are not normal times. And so we should all be ready to make some adjustments to mm. help um, government. And then at the same time, not to make workers worse off. So um, we should rest assured that um, come April 2021, um, we will sit um, through the um, tripartite negotiations team mm -hmm. and make sure that whatever it is that we have to do um, for public workers um, will be done. And I believe that at the end of the day, government will not be made worse off, and so will the worker uh, not be made worse off, okay. as well as our employers who employ um, people in these difficult times. Great. So, Honorable, maybe la one last question for you that came through is th this Ghana, the idea of making the Ghana card a revenue uh, generator or an opportunity to uh, collect taxes from the citizen. Uh, practically, how do you foresee that being implemented so that we get the revenue that we expect to get from that? So I think um, in the President's State of the Nation's address, the President announced that we are going to link our Ghana cards to uh, our team members and so many other essential services. Mm -hmm. And so what um, government is doing is that it's trying to make sure that um, the NI is set up in these um, tax offices as well. So that, um, one, uh, they will have access to that data that they, uh, they need um, to be able to place people, identify people, and then um, to be able to place them on the tax net. We know it's not going to be an easy task, but um, what we are asking all of us is that um, this, is, this is something that we ought to do. Revenue generation is um, uh, first and foremost, if any government wants to see to the development of infrastructure, I heard said mentioning um, the energy sector and the fact that a government can do something I mean, to help reduce the cost of energy um, um, in the industry. Uh, and all these things will require some form of funding. And so it is all of us. It's, 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 it's a shared burden yeah. that we all make sure that we make ourselves available mm -hmm. when or when and where it is due yeah. to enable us to contribute to the revenue generation of this country. And I believe that um, if we start like this, we'll be able to increase... Um, the tax net, once we increase the tax net, like um, George Ankuma said, once we increase the tax net, it will reduce the tax burden eventually. Because there are some taxes that are, um, have timelines, um, mm -hmm. like the, the one in the banking sector, after five years, it will be subject to um, review. All these things, once we are able to increase the tax net and the burden comes down, we will, we will be in a better position to raise more without necessarily increasing our taxes okay so thank you honorable so maybe the last one on taxes um we see a lot of taxes being introduced and some of these are indirect taxes that has the uh, that have the potential of increasing 
uh, price of goods and services. We are targeting inflation at less than uh, 10%, 8% plus or minus 2. Um, are we able to target inflation at less than 10% given that uh, these taxes that have been introduced have the potential of increasing the price of goods and services? Yes, and um, we can all reconnect. In 2017, we inherited an inflation rate of 15.4%. Mm -hmm. And this government puts some policies and measures in place. And prior to 2020, we saw a single digit inflation number. Um, things have changed um, due to the effects, adverse effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it affected the economy adversely. And we have seen some... Um, in the, when we revised the inflation target in 2020 during the media review, um, we gave ourselves 11%. Uh, and uh, thankfully, we have been able to work hard and put it well. It's, it's put, we didn't get to the 11%, but we have to, uh, 10 .4. And inflation, uh, it's a persistent increase in prices, not just um, a one off increase. Yes, we have seen, uh, we are going to see some increases in. Taxes and um, it might affect um, uh, the energy cost uh, 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 sector, and it might also affect uh, the items that depend on um, fuel. So uh, yes, in the short term, we will see some increase in, in, in prices, but inflation for inflation to happen, it will have to be persistent. But I believe that the kind of things that the government is putting in place. And with the support of um, the Bank of Ghana through the inflation targeting framework and the way it is managing the monetary policies of this country, I believe that um, we will be able to achieve um, the 8% plus or minus 2. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also looking at um, the free trade, one thing that will help um, help inflation is the increase in the production of um, goods and services. And if we all take advantage of um, uh, the free trade, and produce more, I believe that it will also help us in this direction to help us achieve um, the inflation rate of 8 plus or minus 2. And so, yes, initially, we will see some increase in prices, but in the uh, medium term, we believe that um, um, we can hit uh, the targets that we have set for ourselves, looking at what we have put in place, and with the support of the Bank of Ghana through its policies, um, we will be able to achieve. Um, uh, okay, great. So thank you, Honorable. Thank you very much. Uh, so keep your questions coming through the Q&A box. Uh, so we got some questions from Kofi Solomon Odonko. So one for AGI. So said before I come to your next question, uh, there's a question here for you. Uh, so what can AGI do to reduce under invoicing, which is so pervasive and undermines the business environment? So said your three. Thank you. Um, yes, it is perfectly right. We've been very concerned about it. I remember at the very beginning of the current government's term of office, it's one of the issues AGI raised with His Excellency the Vice President and the Economic Management Team. And immediately a committee was set up between AGI and Customs because what is happening is that if you declare your goods, uh, you are the invoice, it means that you pay much lower duties and then make your products more competitive because you are not paying so much duty. And when, you ha when it happens that way, it undermines local production because it makes local products more expensive, especially if it's an imported product. So it was really of great concern to us. And it's all part of the discussion that resulted in all the uh, measures at the ports, the new system that has been introduced, the digital system that has been introduced, and so on and so forth. Indeed, uh, even the cargo tracking note that was introduced at some point, which made it mandatory for all shipments to have a particular number so that it can be tracked all the way to the supplier. So that if you declare a certain value and volume and it's not consistent with what the, 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 the customs know, they can check through the tracking system to know exactly what the actual value was. And they use that as the basis to charge your view. I remember one thing we also noticed, even at the committee that was set up between customs and AGI, we noticed that we needed to even educate the custom officers about some product uh, details. The, 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 their business is about customs. They are not industries. And therefore, they needed to understand the business, the products that they are dealing with. 
For example, somebody in Boss Cables declares it, the value, but then the packaging, cables are supposed to come in cards. He declares this in the form of packets. So when it comes, the custom officer is confused. So the declared value by the, the, the importer is what he uses because he doesn't understand how the packaging arrangement is. We were all about the way supposed to be in course. The course of specific length and all that. So it must be consistent with what the product definition and packaging is. The same thing applies to the fruit juices, for example. The, the fruit juices, it comes either in concentrates or in, 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 in finished product. Different levels are different values. If the custom officer responsible for this doesn't understand the product, he will accept any value declared by the, 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 the importer. So we noticed this were all problems. So we actually had training sessions. We took some of the custom officers to the factories to let them understand the whole product that they are dealing with. And that was, for me, very helpful. So most of the measures that are taking place at the custom, some of them were, were also informed by the, the advocacy we did. And we continue to do so. We have absolutely no problem at all uh, exposing people who are under invoicing and under declaring the values because it actually has direct impact on business. And we continue to do so. So we've been supporting at all levels. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Seth and Victor, thank you for that question. Very, very important one. Um, so, um, Seth, maybe the question for you here is local content. I mean, local content is uh, <laughs> something that you always say, uh, just like Paul said. Um, it's just like in every environment. We say it every now and then. We have codified our local content in our petroleum uh, local content. I know even in the renewable energy space, we still have uh, local content in the form of some law or policy. Now, all of these local content policies and laws uh, would after. Uh, what where do we police them so that uh, we don't just talk about them, but we put this local content policies and laws uh, in a way that we benefit from after. I mean, what's your advice to government that all these local content laws that we are developing, we now have after, we have a bigger market. How do we get our local content or locals involved in the production of goods and services to benefit from after? Well, thank you. I know local content, as you said, is very important because uh, we have to ensure that local participation is good. That is what benefits us the most because if uh, we have we create opportunities, all the measures that government is bringing, the, the CARES program, the development bank, the industry activities, everything is creating opportunities for locals to benefit and creating the jobs. So if you don't have the local content aspect, then it means that your market to be dominated and the, uh, the businesses and opportunities to be taken away without your local benefit. And I think most countries do it. In the case of the petroleum sector, it's even been made a law. And that's why they've established the local content uh, uh, committee under the uh, Petroleum Commission and it's monitoring all this. Now, aligning it to after, uh, local content is actually looking at participation and making sure that business opportunities are given to the locals. The after the But they are. The angle that we have to look at in order for us to benefit as a country is that within the after arrangement, we have the different uh, categorization of goods. We have the exclusive list, which is about 3%. That 3% is protected. In that case, it's considered a very critical goods for development. So, uh, high duties to be imposed on imported products so that uh, it's not affecting the local production. And, and for now, there is no indication that that exclusive place uh, will be part of the legalized place. What it means is that if you are producing products under that exclusive list, you are always protected, even though there is after. Mm -hmm. There is another group, which is the legalized products, which is about 90% of the products. That is what the after is about. So 90% of the products you are dealing with are going to be fully legalized. In that case, those goods can come into your country duty free, quota free, and you have no choice. You only have to compete to be able to survive in the market. That's why you don't have much choice. The choice you have there is to develop your local capacities to be able to be competitive and, and, then, and then take advantage of the market. And then there is the sensitive list, which is 7%. That 7% has a sunset clause. It's for a certain period. So in the early years, about five years or so, it's going to be protected for you. 
Beyond that, it is also going to be legalized. It's going to be added to the 90% to make 97%. So your strategy in terms of local content is that this sensitive list that you have seven, five years or so window, how do you ensure, do you to ensure that you put local capacity, take advantage of it during the period of the protection, and then become so competitive that when it is liberalized, you actually have competitive edge over import that will come in. We experienced similar thing under the common external types. There was a window like that. We kept quiet over it. Before we realized the five years has passed, you know, the, the, and then we had to liberalize. And then when we liberalized, the products from the source became much cheaper. And then it was displacing local uh, production. So our, if you are relating the CFTA to local content, I will look at it from the angle that, especially the sensitive list, where we have a certain window, Let's quickly move in there, pick the products under the sensitive list, make sure we have we develop local capacity, which companies are producing them, what intervention can we do to those uh, companies, build their capacity so that they produce at very competitive price. At the same time, we are also helping to improve our business environment such that the cost of production is cheaper. So the work is totally liberalized. Even if you liberalize and the products are coming from other countries, you are competitive enough the local market and also in the, in the continental market. So I think this is how we can look at it as far as after a local content is concerned. But then the other aspect is that when you are pushing local content development, it cannot exist forever. Normally, it's about local competitiveness also. So whilst pushing local content, make sure that your environment is good, cost of production is, 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 is low, mm -hmm. and then you push companies access to finance and all the things that we've been talking about. If you position them that way, by taking advantage of local content, you are expanding their capacity so that they take advantage of after that as social come. Basically, the after is about imports and exports. You are importing goods into your country duty free quota fee. You are also exporting to other countries duty free quota fee. And the name of the game is competitiveness. So if you put your capacity and produce at a larger scale so that cost per unit reduces, then you become competitive. Mm -hmm. So local content should be aimed at building capacity to make our products more competitive to take advantage of the after. Okay. Thank you very much, Seth. Uh, so I've got two questions here, uh, Florence Asante Mensa. And um, so George, I'll just alert you before I come to you. So uh, she's asking uh, penalty exemption for industry on accrued taxes. Uh, she wants uh, some explanation as to how that's going to work. So, exemption or waiver of penalties and interest on accrued taxes. So, George, I'll come back to you uh, for you to answer that. And Honorable uh, Abna Osei Asare, someone wants to know whether there's going to be changes in the individual income tax rate. I think it was silent, the budget was silent on that. So, I'll come back to you whether you have any idea if it's going to change or there's going to change or you're going to maintain the status quo. So we go straight to uh, Mr. Ewa. Uh, so the question for you, uh, Mr. Ewa, is this, that the budget statements introducing 5% financial sector cleanup level. <laughs> this is going to apply alongside the national fiscal stabilization level of 5%. So effectively, you're paying 10% on your profit before tax. So what has been the response of the Ghana Association of Bankers? Are uh, you welcoming this and all excited to pay so that we are able to clear all the areas that have been accrued in the sector? So, John. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yes, um, since the announcement of this additional levy on the banks, uh, we have been quite vocal and we've been on the field trying to have this uh, taking a second look at because of, in our view, the potential, uh, perhaps unintended consequences it might have on the entire agenda that the market, uh, the budget is seeking uh, to achieve. First and foremost, uh, we all agree on one thing. We agree that we are in uncertain times. The uncertain times that have been aggravated by the economic effect of the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And during uncertain times, you need stronger banks. You need banks with stronger capital bases. It is not the time to introduce levies and taxes and charges 
that limit banks' ability to accumulate capital. So by the introduction, sheer introduction of this tax alone, uh, banks' capacity of building um, a stronger base to be able to absorb potential shocks that will be introduced by the impact of the pandemic gradually is taking, being taken away from the banks. And I think it's a situation that needs proper uh, scrutiny and a second look at. And if you look at B Bank of Ghana, what has Bank of Ghana done? Uh, what they are saying is they understand the overall picture of the impact potential that um, the COVID can have on the business community, households and individuals, and by extension, on banks. Because when bank, uh, businesses suffer, hotels are unable to open, and uh, hotels don't exist in a vacuum. Banks are financing them. And it means that if a hotel is going down, it is a bank that is being dragged along. And therefore, we need the banks to have solidified base. And that is why Bank of Ghana has introduced some form of restrictions, even on the payment of dividend within the banking sector, for banks to meet certain um, uh, prudential thresholds before you can decide to pay dividend. And we need all hands on deck to assist banks or the industry in building capacity in terms of stronger capital base. That is one. Two, hearing uh, Mr. Sechum Akwabua, it is clear that cost of doing business in this country is at levels that, are make, that, that, that is making Ghana very uncompetitive on the global stage. Hitherto, we were trading amongst ourselves. We were locked up in Ghana. Now we're going to sign this document that opens opportunities and threats. So if the cost of doing business is at A, and by taking action, it takes it to A plus B, what are we saying? Are we capacitizing businesses to take advantage of after? Or we are now introducing layers and layers of inhibitions and limitations on businesses' capacity to take advantage of the continental free trade arena. We are not trading up amongst ourselves anymore. So the capital flows go to where the returns meet the requirements of the, of, the, of the investor. Now, this additional tax imposition, which is on top of a levy banks are paying, that levy we are paying now, the National Stabilization Levy, was supposed to be in place for three years. 20 years on, banks are still paying. Then on top of that, another five percent, and nobody knows for price to 2024, but nobody knows when this is going to go away. If we are an investor sitting somewhere and we are looking at banks in the West Africa sub-region, would we be attracted to an environment where overnight the tax burden on the, an industry can be increased by five percent, or you go to where the tax burden can be predictable and, and therefore you know your returns is setting? So Cote d'Ivoire has an effective tax rate effectively around 25%. And Nigeria is around 30%. And in Ghana, with this getting through, we are now putting banks at a, in an effective tax rate of 35%. It is a leak table that banks in Ghana are topping that we do not deserve. We do not think this is the time to overburden the industry, when is the time to talk about how much more loans can banks give to industry? How much more loans can banks, or how much more restructuring can banks do to sectors that have been negatively impacted? It is not the time to talk about how much more can we inhibit the banks from being able to inject and anchor the, the race towards the economic recovery post-COVID, or even from now, uh, from now onwards. We, we, we have everything going for us on our justification. More so, even the reasoning that was given for the imposition to, to, to pay off the uh, uh, banking sector cleaning up debt. <laughs> As though the remaining banks were complicit in the demise of the banks that went under. It, it could not a, a, a sense of our involvement in their downfall, which is a signal you do not want to even send to the global community. That is it is there a report out there somewhere which is not open to the public that says perhaps the remaining banks were also doing something wrong for which reason they have to be penalized i mean <laughs> what i know basic uh, uh, economics one plus one is you reward good efforts that is what you reward you do not penalize people banks 
that have rather been able to stay the tide and have carried the country along. Last year, between March and December last year, in the, in the midst of this uncertainty, banks still availed over 14 billion Ghana cities in new loans. In the midst of uncertainty where banks were supposed to stay back and watch the environment, we still sat with our customers and restructured over 4 billion cities worth of loans. In the midst of COVID-19 and the pandemic, and in response to the regulatory measures, banks reduced their lending rate by up to 350 basis points, putting in quantum amount over 194 million CDs cash that should have gone to banks as interest income back into the pockets of borrowing customers. Those are some of our contributions. We voted 10 million Ghana CDs as COVID relief fund. So it should be an environment where we are saying, what more can banks do? Not an environment where we say, what can we take from banks so that we limit the ability to do more? And coming to who pays for the tax, um, if you clean up financial sector, who are the participants in the financial sector? Don't, banks don't exist in a vacuum. Banks exist with economic actors. So we are exist with our businesses, there are other industries, we have the telcos, we have the chamber, we have, we have the mining companies, we have the oil companies, we have commerce, we have advisory and consultancy. They are all part of the ecosystem. How do you take one segment of an ecosystem and levy this hefty penalty on them for something they did not cause. We think it is not only misguided, it is also potentially explosive and unproductive. And the earlier we all come back, uh, go back to the drawing table and say, what can we do? Instead of levying banks, can we think about an equitable levy that says, um, okay, yeah, these banks that went and that they were being audited, okay, audit, audit firms will pay 1%. And the uh, buying companies were part of the ecosystem. Um, um, you pay 1%. The uh, telcos pay 1%. Banks, yes, we then that will pay 2%. In total, we have 8% or 9. 9% of certain X will give you even more than the amount they are seeking to reach. So our point is the incidence of tax, which is targeting an industry that we rather need for, for it to be on a solid footing to help propel the wheels of the economy forward uh, during these uncertain times. Okay. Thank you very much, John. That's, that's very uh, insightful. And we like the, all the information and the context that you placed it. And so government actors will take notes. Uh, so effectively, like you said, we are 35% for banks. And so yes. that relative to what other countries. So that's the benchmark that Prof mentioned earlier. That if you are benchmarking yourself, you say you are creating a neighboring environment. What's the cost of um, doing business in Ghana in terms of taxes? So how do you compare with others in the region? If you're able to do that, then you ask yourself, are we too high or too low? Then that's I, 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 just to interrupt you, and I apologize for this. Yeah, I, right. really, I really love what Professor Gopin said. I am in love with that. We have said enabling environment and things are in the pipeline for centuries. <laughs> decades and decades and decades. If you ask me what the benchmark inflation rate, we are all, always chasing single digit inflation as a country. Every government measures its success by its ability to bring the inflation rate to single, single digit. 1% is single digit, 9% is single digit. Where is that optimum inflation rate that we believe as a country at this level of our developmental stance we need to prepare the, the economy forward? Is it a single digit? And if so, what is that rate? Or is it that we are fixated on something that does not really help the cost of the country? As a developing country of our standing, we need a certain level of inflation to propel economy, the economy. These are very legitimate and tangible questions that need answering. We need this question answered. This and a lot more answered so that we know as a country, these are our benchmarks. And when we get here, this is what the consequences are. These are the positive effects that they are likely to generate. And I thank Professor Bob, Bob Payne very much for bringing this issue up. Okay, so Prof, we are back to you. I mean, given uh, all the taxes, uh, new tax policy proposals that have been introduced, are we going to be competitive as a country in the midst of after? Hello, yeah. This, this, yes. this is a difficult question, you know. <laughs> I'm saying it's a difficult question because I cannot fail to understand where government finds itself. 
and, and I'm unable to also fail to understand the impact, particularly also highlighted by the CEO of Bankers Association. I mean, so it, it's, it's quite difficult. Look, baseline, nobody enjoys paying tax. Nobody enjoys paying tax. Look, during the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, one of the questions he couldn't avoid to answer was whether it was lawful to pay taxes to Caesar. As a religious leader, he had to answer that question. Otherwise, they were not going to forgive him. <laughs> the <difficult> question, right? <laughs> okay, so, so you see, there's a school of thought in economics that says that macroeconomic stability is a precondition to economic transformation. Mm -hmm. So first, restore macroeconomic stability. That is going to come at a cost. That is where we are now. Government drive to restore macroeconomic stability on a sustainable basis in the immediate to the short term would impose cost. Cost on the private sector, households, individuals. That is where we are now. And that is why I'm saying that I cannot fail to sympathize with government. But that cost would, 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 would come in the form of reduced cash flow available to private sector to expand. That cost would also come to reduce cash flow, which would affect savings and investment drive of households, individuals, mm -hmm. and all of that. We are going along that path. So it's about also managing the trade-off. Mm -hmm. So, and the question is, perhaps where we find ourselves, these tax measures that have been introduced, mm -hmm. are they the optimal tax handles to employ at a time like this? Okay. Would we have maybe shared the burden, okay, across a certain number of industries where, where because burden shared, I'm told, is easier to carry, okay? Mm -hmm. Because baseline, where we find ourselves, it is not sustainable for government at the state level to mm -hmm. absorb this debt and carry them along. It is not. In fact, so when our debt stock started building up and all of that, we knew the signal effect that there is signals uncertainty in terms of the probability of, of, of hiking tactics. And that is where we are. Because at some point in time, in resolving the energy crisis, the state absorbed the, the, the burden. Financial crisis, we absorb the burden. Pandemic, the state absorbed the burden. But the state cannot continue to carry that. So it gets to a point and the, the state will decide, okay, to shift the burden now to the citizens. And citizens here, you can, you can include body corporates. And the rest, so that is where we are. So the state is trying to shift the burden now to the citizens, okay, and all of that. In some jurisdictions, because now we have improved monetary policy framework, one way of doing it was, was perhaps to, to print more CDs. But that is also another way of shifting the burden to the citizens. Because when you print more CDs, the, the inflationary pressures will cause, uh, uh, it's also represent effectively a form of taxation on your income. Yes. And, and all of that, okay. So, so government is looking at the trade-off across all these levels. Mm -hmm. But perhaps the question we are asking is, maybe, would, wouldn't it have been a bit more user-friendly mm -hmm. in, our, in our resolve to make private sector the lead in our economic transformation, maybe to consider other progressive tax handles, mm -hmm. share the burden, is that okay, in a more predictable framework, because in the business community, predict, pre, pre, predictability is important. Okay, okay. Nobody lasts uncertainty. Yes. Okay. And then you're also looking at the timing of the introduction. Okay. Banks, corporate Ghana, they've planned for the year. Okay. Many of them have done their budget, maybe perhaps towards the end of last year for implementation this year. And then first quarter, uh, at the beginning of, let's say, second quarter, all these things are coming true. Okay, so that itself unsettles the business community and all of us. But we also do recognize that government is in a tight situation. Okay, and, and, and if they don't take certain steps, it's going to affect the ability to create the enabling environment we are yet to define. Okay. 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 So thank you very much. So what, what I wanted to chip in quickly is that mm -hmm. I didn't see a lot in terms of our tax exemptions regime. Mm -hmm. I know in 2018, the president talked about doing the State of the Nation address that a new exemption bill has gone to parliament. Yes. I don't know what has happened in that area because that is a critical area that perhaps we can block the leak holes. And then let's also measure our progress. 
uh, uh, the extent of digitization in our revenue administration, we know it can eliminate the leakages in the revenue visible to individual pockets for, uh, for all you know. Okay, mm -hmm. so what is our progress along those lines? Why should people still go to market people and say that give the money to me for me to send it to GRA? We are unsure whether it will actually arrive. Okay, <laughs> then what digitization can help and all of so this will be my CD submission on this issue. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, so, George, maybe the question to you earlier was the waiver of penalties and interest on accrued taxes. You can respond to that quickly, and then I'll ask you your, uh, someone will say your media question. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you yeah. So, so um, what this means simply is that it is a kind of amnesty that the government is giving to businesses that have tax liabilities over the years that they have not paid. So, what government is saying is that under the tax law, there are penalties and interest which are very punitive as it is now. So that means says that, look, if you have tax liabilities up to December 2020 that you have not paid, do an introspective uh, reflection of yourself, um, maybe through what we call a health check, tax health check within your system, to see what taxes that you have or you should have paid over the period that you have not paid. I give you opportunity between now and September, make arrangement to settle those taxes, and I will not charge you the interest and penalties. In fact, the penalties as it is currently is the Bank of Ghana interest rate plus a quarter, compounded monthly. So if you look at that, uh, the interest rate plus a quarter compounded monthly, then you are over 20% 20, 20 thereabouts, and mm -hmm. then compounding of that interest. So if you have tax liability sitting for 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20, and on monthly basis, this is being compounded, you see that the liability and the interest itself can be very, very significant. So as part of the, the, the uh, incentive that government is giving under this, this budget, uh, government has proposed that if you can make agreement to settle any taxes that you have not paid over the period, I will give you a waiver. So, so in other words, government wants you to keep those um, interest and penalties in your pocket, use it for other purposes, and just come and agree to pay the tax itself. So that is all that the, the um, exemption of interest and penalty um, is, is about. Okay. So thank you very much, George. I think um, that uh, helps put a lot of clarity on that issue because uh, people are just wondering what this waiver is, how they take advantage of it. Okay, so the question for you, uh, George, now is uh, the introduction of taxes seems to be like a topical discussion point for 2021. There are, however, some rebates targeted at businesses. Uh, can you throw more light on some of these rebates? And so uh, who benefits from these rebates? Uh, does it apply to all businesses? Okay, thank you, yeah. So, so the rebates that uh, the government proposed under the budget um, about four or five, and I'll mention some of them. Uh, one of such is the exemption of gains, exemption from tax of gains made from the Ghana Stock Exchange. Over the years, this exemption has been there, but what happens is that it is always having a certain limited period. So. The current one is due to expire end of this year, for instance. So investors on the Ghana Stock Exchange then in their minds know that after 2021, if I have if I make gains from the exchange, I was then going to pay a certain tax. So there has always been that level of uncertainty around investing and in, on the Ghana Stock Exchange and how the income from that will be taxed because every now and then there is a change then it's extended, then it's extended. So what this budget sought to do is to make it more permanent. So there's now a certainty around investing on the Ghana Stock Exchange as far as taxation of the gains is concerned. That now, if you make such gains permanently, you are not going to pay tax. Once this is passed into law, uh, I, I, I would say it's very effective now until it's passed into law. So once it's passed into law, then it will mean that if you make gains from the exchange you are not going to pay tax on this means that investors have some level of certainty like i said and also then means that 
um, it will sort of bring more attraction to the to the to the exchange because you know that this is one area that can invest, make returns. And the minister um, of trade, I think, mentioned earlier on some of the efforts that government is doing to enhance the the viability of the exchange, and so that will mean that the exchange will continue to flourish. And if you invest there and you make gains, you are not going to suffer any tax tax um, from from that side. So that is the first one. The second one has to do with what I just um, discussed uh, from the question that was asked. That's the suspension of interest and penalty, which automatically then leaves some money in the pocket of taxpayers because you are willing to settle your liabilities that you should have done over the years that you have not done and you are not paying the um, interest and the penalties that you would ordinarily have paid. And so some gains for you um, there, but you have to then do your own um, check to be sure that this is how much because you also see um, from what what the budget statement uh, said that the government is going to be a bit more aggressive in tax audits and all that so after this that is going to actually happen so you need to take action now before the tax authorities come in because when they come in after the suspension of this interest and penalties then it means that they will apply it um, as it were another one that the government sought to do under the budget is also grant a 30% reduction in the corporate income tax of um, certain uh, sectors um, that were significantly impacted by the pandemic. And you know hotels and restaurants, education sector, arts and entertainment sector, uh, the travel and tour uh, sector, they were significantly impacted. And the government has proposed a 30% reduction in their tax rate. I, I would have wished that uh, this, this would have even been a complete um, waiver or exemption as far as corporate income tax is concerned for the year. Uh, this exemption is for the, because first quarter has already passed, and so it's for the second to fourth quarter of the year. But I, I would have wished that uh, this would have been made um, complete uh, exemption for such sectors because they were significantly impacted so that the little that they can um, leave um, can be reinvested back and then people who lost their jobs can be now uh, employed back into the system um, just to ensure that um, they have livelihood and, and also that automatically brings more revenue in terms of personal income tax and all that. So that was my expectation, um, but then uh, the proposal is the 30% uh, reduction, which is also fine. Then also there is a suspension proposal to suspend the quarterly income tax that is paid by these small, small businesses seamstresses, the uh, traders, market traders and all that, hairdressers and all that, they also pay what we call the tax, tax stamp and they pay that on quarterly basis. What government is saying is that we are going to give you that exemption or suspension of the taxes for the rest of the of the period as second to the fourth quarter, you will not pay these taxes. And, and for these people, these little taxes they pay uh, is significant for them and so they can then reinvest this back into their businesses for the rest of the year. And then also with the, uh, those in the transport sector, uh, commercial vehicles also pay what you call the VIT, vehicle income tax. They also pay on quarterly basis. And what they are saying is that under this, this, this proposal, government is saying that you would not have to pay for the rest from second quarter. So for you to actually enjoy these benefits, you also have to meet that part of your obligation by ensuring that you have complied with tax laws, read down your registrations and all that. And then if there's any tax you should have paid with you during the first quarter, you have paid that. Then you can enjoy this um, waivers or exemptions that the government is seeking to grant to these sectors. Okay, so thank you very much, George. Uh, so we are going to our last round of questions. Um, so starting from Honorable uh, Abna Osei. So I've got two questions from you. Uh, Francis Sementia initially asked, which I pointed out to you, um, whether there's going to be any change in the individual tax rates. Um, thank you, Honorable Abna. Um, the question is, um, what is the impact of the individual tax rates? Mm -hmm. mentioned. One, um, yes, and this country has um, KPIs. 
because um, we are hoping that in the medium, the short, the medium term, we are going to transform this economy and get it back on track. And so we put out these KPIs: one, to have an overall GDP growth rate of five percent, to have an inflation of um, eight plus or minus two percent, and all overall fiscal balance and the primary balance would return to the fiscal responsibility act of um. 5% and a positive primary balance. So this is the context in which we find ourselves. These are the KPIs that um, we, have, um, we have targeted, hoping that in the short to medium term, we will realize these things. And um, there are so many things that it's true that we need to come up with specific KPIs. Let me start with um, the PPP, the Public Private Partnership. Initially, it was just a partnership between uh, the private sector and the government. And we realized that, no, let us come up with some formalized way of um, handling this kind of partnership because this is what we believe can propel um, the economic growth that we are all looking for. And so government uh, went to parliament with the PPP bill. Now we have the acts and waiting for government assent. So, yes, we will get there. There are quite a number of KPIs that, in addition to what I have mentioned, and we look forward to coming up with so that we can assess ourselves every time and see whether we are meeting it or we are not meeting and what can we do to help us uh, meet those uh, um, KPIs. And again, um, I go to John. John mentioned that um, it's like a punitive measure for those who sort of um, did everything right in the banking sector. No, but um, if 2018 we had allowed just, I mean, one or two banks to collapse, I mean, it would have had their consequences on the financial sector. Of this country, and that is why government invested 21 billion into it. And now, government is saying that at that time we needed that kind of investment, and that was the reason why uh, the banks were able to stand the test of time. The rest of the banks, and now the banks have been capitalized. And um, when you look at um, their assets, I mean, they are doing they are doing well compared to um, before the 2018 levels, and now government is saying that. This kind of investment that I did into the banking sector, usually with investments that governments do, like um, government invest in roots, you get something in return. Government invest in education, you get something in return. So government is saying that support us now. Uh, uh, we are in a situation where we cannot continue to do that alone. So let us share that burden. And I believe that um, it is not something that government is doing to penalize the, um, the, the, the sector, but rather government is saying, I have gone... I have done this at this time, and now I need you to support me to complete the process. We all know um, um, with the, the effects of the Anderson M1 case, that changed the whole um, way of reporting and um, um, financial statements. And so these things do happen to help us improve upon the way things are done. And it comes at a cost. So this is the cost that we have to incur. The, the 5% before profits that government is charging we will not be able to um, pay for all the 21 billion um, that government has invested. But government is saying, share that burden with me. Um, help me reduce the investments that I did when we needed that investment so much. And so um, I, I will say that let's embrace it and let's see how best we can engage so that when the time comes and we need to amend or assess it, we'll be in a, in a very good position to amend or assess it, see whether we will continue with it or not. And um, my, my, the Francis asked about um, the personal income tax regime, whether something is going yes. to be Usually, all the measures, the tax measures that um, we want to undertake in a particular year is, um, is done in the budget. So once it is not in the budget for from January to the, we will go to Parliament, in the media around July, and to assess how far we have come with the measures that we have put in place. But currently, as we speak, the personal income tax regime wasn't mentioned, wasn't touched, so um, it is not part of the tax regime from um, now to July. We don't know what will happen in July, but currently, as we speak, um, it is not part of um, the tax measures that we um, took to okay. So okay. That, that is um, what I, I want to okay, say. Okay, so uh, just uh, one for you. So is government going to review uh, tax exemption re regime? Is there something on the table like that? Uh, As um, um, Paul mentioned, it's true we took um, 
um, the tax exemption bills to parliament. And we had um, upon engagement with um, the finance committee and other stakeholders, we realized we had to take it back and improve upon it. We have done that improvement, and I'm sure that um, soon we we'll hear that um, it's, it's been sent back to parliament. And we did that first, um, we took that first initiative of taking it to parliament, engaging the finance committee and the other stakeholders. And we were asked to amend quite a number of things which we have done. So um, rest assured that um, the tax exemption regime is being looked at, and we believe that government can make some savings in that, uh, in that area when we uh, come up with uh, an act to guide our tax regime. Okay, great. That's helpful. So the last or the final for you, Honorable, is government working towards the target lending rate to support SMEs? Uh, who are regarded as the engine of growth? Um, prior to this budget, government um, had done a lot for the SMEs. When the effects of the coronavirus pandemic was at its peak last year, government introduced the corona alleviation uh, package for businesses, especially the small to medium scale enterprises. And in that package, um, businesses that applied for between 300 to 2,000 Ghana cities, um, they were given these monies as grants. Mm -hmm. And businesses that applied from um, beyond that um, 10,000 to 300,000, 300,000 Ghana cities, they were given um, interest of about 5% and a one year moratorium. I mean, three of them um, interested in principal. So, government, yes, is doing something in that regard for the small and medium scale enterprises. Um, as of the time, we're taking the budget to Parliament. The NBSSI, which is the agency facilitating this policy initiative of government, had distributed, dispersed 503,000, 503 million out of the 750 million that government allocated for this particular purpose. And, and it had also given to 290,000 SMEs. And we are hoping that we will be able to complete and um, uh, disperse the full amount. So in this regard, yes, government has done something and government will continue to support SMEs, not just in the area of um, um, availability of funds, but also to make sure that um, they are comfortable by providing once again, let me see the neighboring environment because you will need the neighboring environment for these SMEs to thrive. Even when you give them money and they don't have access to electricity, don't have access to water, there's no, they don't have access to quality labor, and um, they cannot survive um, in, in that regard. So, government is also doing that in addition to um, the special uh, funding arrangements that is given to the SMEs. Okay. Thank you very much, Honorable. Uh, so, the last one for you, uh, Seth. So, the budget proposes new levies, uh, as has been uh, discussed here. Uh, these new taxes seem to be a topical issue. Uh, what's the worry for you, Seth? Uh, do you have any concerns uh, with these new taxes? Well, thank you. I think as has been well explained by the Honorable. Uh, at some point, you don't have a choice than to impose some taxes. So we are not uh, completely against imposition of new taxes, especially with the pandemic situation. Uh, government doesn't seem to have much choice but to ask the citizen to, com to, to uh, contribute. So I can understand that we have introduced some taxes and we need to somehow cooperate. But then there are a few issues that we also need to take note of. The effort to mobilize tax revenue to support our, our, our income, especially seeing the debt level is also so high. A, a couple of issues here. I think that um, government has made a very strong statement when it comes to industrial development. And industrial development has made its key agenda uh, in the next coming years. And therefore, when taxes are being introduced, you want to see it reflected in the government's own agenda. Unfortunately, some of the taxes that have been introduced seem to be counterproductive and it's not supporting the new industrial agenda. And I think it has to be uh, looked at closely. For example, the flat rate of being increased from 3% to 4%. What it means is that 
Along the flat rate regime, it favors traders more. If you import, you only bring the goods in, you put a flat uh, rate of 3%, and then it goes to the, 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 the retailer and is selling the market. Only one level. In the case of manufacturers, it goes to their key distributors. In some instances, they even have wholesalers in the middle before you go to retailers. At each of these levels, you have to slap a 3%. So it has what we call the cascading effect. In the, long, in the end, the product price will be higher than the one that doesn't have different levels of uh, distribution chain. And therefore, the introduction of the 3%, we complain that it's actually not very supportive of local industries who have different levels of distribution chain. So if it wasn't reviewed and taken out and it's been increased, then that brings a bit of a concern. The other aspect is the NHIL, which has also been increased from 5% to 6%. What it means is that, you know, the VAT regime, the VAT is an input tax. So when you impose it, the, fund, the incidence of the tax is on the final consumer. Therefore, when you input it, you can also get it back uh, by way of uh, uh, charging it to the final consumer. Yeah. And this was converted from uh, into 5% levy and then 12.5% VAT. Now, we thought that was also not very pro-industry because most of the industries, they, they charge it as income tax and they must get it back. When it became a levy, they cannot retrieve that. It adds to their cost, it becomes a levy, and therefore adds to their cost mm -hmm. and makes it more expensive. Again, so we thought that this should be reviewed, probably withdrawn or somehow, but then it's been increased instead. So it means that it's also not very supportive of manufacturing and government's own agenda of promoting industrialization, and especially in the work of the CFTA that we are discussing today, mm -hmm. if you are adding to your cost of production, then you are making your local industries less and less competitive. So we have to look at that aspect of the tax. The other ones like the petroleum tax and all that, it is a shared burden. We all have to support government. We all we must all understand and, and, and contribute. So we don't have too much problem with that. It's a consumption tax. Everybody must contribute. Because government must mobilize their resources, so we must support government. We only have a little concern here. Uh, it's not the imposition of the tax per se, but then we think that while doing it, we must also look at the efficiency in the collection of, 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 of taxes. For example, there's been a lot of complaints, and even in the budget statement, the minister acknowledged it, that there are linkages in the petroleum industry. So good petroleum products are coming to the country, the finished products. They are supposed to pay a certain level. Some of them are able to maneuver, enter the market without paying those levels. And there's a lot of leakages there. All kinds of competitions are going on. I cannot uh, be so sure of the numbers. But then it's running into more than a billion. And it means that whatever you are mobilizing through the imposition of this revenue, perhaps could have been obtained if you, you would have uh, blocked the leakages. So we cannot continue increasing and imposing new taxes. Whilst we are not blocking the leakages, we have to do it in tandem such that when you block the leakages, it gets to a point where you realize you may not even need the imposition of additional taxes. At this moment, it's a crucial period, it's, it's a difficult situation, so we have to impose the tax. But let's also look at the revenue leakages that is arising out of this. The bankers one, I think uh, my friend John has spoken a lot at it, and, and, and the minister has also given the answers. The only thing I will add here is that. But I think I like the minister's last point that we need to continuously engage. I think our um, industry feels that uh, when you surprise uh, uh, industry with taxes, sometimes it brings a shock, you know, so we need to engage. And then how do you also ensure that the industry has been complaining about cost of capital? How do you ensure that this imposition will not translate into higher cost of capital for, for companies? Mind you, we are talking CFT. So if you are adding to the cost of borrowing, uh, it's also uh, a disincentive for production and then being competitive at the, at the, at the internal level and then and the after as well. So we think that there must be some engagement. And if there's engagement, there's a possibility of spreading the tax, not just imposing on one particular sector, as John mentioned. So if you, and then I'm sure the bankers also have a lot of ideas as to how we can also help mobilize. Uh, 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 some revenue from the banking system to support government's agenda. As I said, we need to have a bit of uh, support and the trade off as uh, you know, both Bokin's uh, message. Okay. Right. But the most important, there must be some discussions around it. And I'm sure there's a discussion 
that you have been created. Okay. The efficiency of collection, as I said, is critical. And the introduction of the, uh, the idea of making the, the, the uh, gamma card numbers, the team numbers, is so brilliant. Let's see how its implementation goes. And then finally, on the tax exemption, I'm happy that it was mentioned that uh, we would revisit the, the, the tax exemption bill. I think it's important. The reason is that hmm. it was a very positive development for industry. Those who are bringing in machinery and all that and have the right to be exempted. There yeah. was some abuse. That's why uh, I'm sure the ministry tried to streamline it, which we supported because yeah. we don't want any abuse. It, it, it becomes a counter uh, productive. Yeah. But then it is also getting to a point where we are never getting it uh, out of the way. People apply for exemption. They wait for so many months. The abuse get to the port. I've had several cases which we have brought to the Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Trade for intervention and all the way to Parliament. And some end up paying huge demolishes when indeed they could have they could have actually they, they were entitled to the exemption. So yeah. I think the, the bill has to be passed quickly so that those who are entitled to it they get the, 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 the exemption as soon as possible and make them uh, progress on their on their efforts. So thank you very much for, for okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So, Prof, I'll come back. I'll come to you on our rising debts. So, a final one for John. So, John, um, and the, in the banking sector, is going to compete with others in other countries across Africa. How prepared are you to face the competition from other countries, given the challenges that you have here, some of which you have rightly intimated? Thank you very much. Um, banks are very well prepared. And before I even um, tackle that, um, let me just uh, use 30 seconds to talk about our compliance level when it comes to taxes. If you speak to the Commissioner General um, uh, of Ghana, he will tell you point blank that um, it, banks are about the most compliant tax um, industry that you, 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 you find in the country. We are not chased to pay taxes. We go chasing the the tax collector and then we make our tax payment so we are not against if there's a fiscal gap um, um having a plan to plug it or what we are talking about is the targeting of an industry for something we did not cause and and i thought i should put that um, into perspective uh, yes um banks are very well placed we know exactly what um uh, the afcfta put where it puts us and the fact that we have to be more competitive we should be able to drive value at the least cost and we should also ensure that our services are one that transcends our bodies. So um, instead of having only correspondent banks in Europe, Americas, and the, uh, Asia, we now have to now go into our fellow countrymen and uh, continent uh, and bankers to have correspondent banking relationships in banks on the continent. Because if you have a, a, a customer trading in uh, Zimbabwe, you must be able to support the customer for financial services, even if you do not have a subsidiary in, in Zimbabwe or in that country. So to that extent, banks have already started work in that area. And mm -hmm. I'm sure banks have started traveling, establishing the needed contacts to be able to facilitate um, the requirements under the AFCFTA. But one point about uh, which I will add about the uh, imposition of this levy. You know, uh, had this levy been, maybe if had ba the banking system been informed, maybe somewhere in 2018 that Oh, uh, along the line, this is what we are going to do. Then there will be proper planning towards this tax. Um, the investment co or investor community um, is not really uh, interested in uncertainty or uh, some things that bring down the ability to plan. So having gone through our budgeting process and all of a sudden wake up one day and 5% of our profit disappears. Um, tomorrow, if we have to go back to that, th those same investors, for capital to enable us support industry during after what, what do you think investors are going to tell us that your your country cannot give us doesn't guarantee uh, uh, or doesn't help us to plan in our returns um, because overnight you know we had the discussions in 2020 in december and we knew our tax burden on invest in your account in your bank now all of a sudden you are having to pay additional five percent how certain are we that uh, tomorrow will not be saddled of another one. Bearing in mind that you're already paying a levy that was supposed to be for three years and after 20 years, you are still paying. So it brings about a whole lot to the table. And I like the point that the Honorable Deputy Minister made 
that we need to engage. Perhaps there are better ways of getting even more, but not raising significant concerns around this levy that potentially will put banks at risk of um, being squeezed out of the market. But as to our readiness to support uh, with the after and also to make us more competitive, I think banks in Ghana are very much ready for that. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, George, I'll ask you one before Prof. So, um, with this uh, intensified tax audit for extractive industry, um, how do the players in the industry prepare themselves for that? There was a question that was asked by someone whether uh, if uh, the, these uh, penalties, exemptions, or waiver of penalties and interest for the period of accrued taxes, does it cover the period where the person has been audited? So maybe you can respond to that before you come to this uh, tax audit that's coming up. Does it cover a period where the person has been uh, gone through a tax audit? Okay, thank you, yeah. So um, for now, I'll say the parameters have not been really defined, but generally, to the extent that you become aware of um, taxes that you should have paid, there maybe have been uh, tax audits, but then those taxes were not identified by the tax auditors, and so you could not pay. You know that what also happens is that the GRE have the mandate to even re-audit. And so the fact that the period has been tax audited does not mean they cannot come back and re-audit. So once you are aware, then it is an opportunity for you to then assess yourself for these taxes and then go declare, make arrangements and settle. Because that then saves you the penalties or interest that would definitely accrue after uh, expiration of this this um, amnesty of a sort that is being given. So that's that's the first thing that I would say. Okay. So the tax audit on the extractive industry? Uh, yes, so the tax audit um, on the extractive industry, um, what we expect is that um, it means that between now or, or even, uh, yeah, I would say between now and then end of the year, they should expect a lot of action from the tax authorities in terms of tax audits. In fact, I know um, already a lot of efforts have been taken. Um, the tax audits will even cover areas around transfer pricing because the sector is one of the areas that is perceived to have a lot of issues around transfer pricing. It's a perception, um, and that's the tax authorities is, is for them to satisfy themselves by doing those audits. And so that is one of the things that they should be looking at. And for that matter, as much as possible, try and do internal health check. Internal okay. health, tax health check, like I said previously, identify all the taxes that you think you should have paid but have not been paid. In the area of transfer pricing, ensure that you have proper documentation put in place because um, I also like to say that there's a new transfer pricing regulation that has actually been passed and it starts this 2021. And so it is, it is important that this sector, which, which is a significant sector within the economy, um, and if the tax authorities have clearly, or if the government have clearly stated that it's an area that they are going to look at, then it's for them to ensure that adequate documentations are put in place when it yeah. comes to issues around transfer pricing, to ensure that they are complying, and then when they are, uh, if they have taxes that they have not fully complied over the period, ensure that that is also covered by taking advantage of the amnesty that has been proposed between now and September, so that once you go in to do the um, said declaration under this provision, yeah. then even if there is a tax audit and they come, you have already declared those taxes and paid, yeah. and so there wouldn't be any penalties on you because you have paid. You know, when it comes to taxes, there are timelines for one to comply. So you may have paid a certain tax by paid it after the due date. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you did not pay your withholding taxes by the 15th of the month following the month in which the transaction relates, or you did not pay uh, your employee income taxes by the time it was due and all that, you have subsequently gone to pay, but because you did not pay them by the due date, due date in the event of a tax audit, the penalties and interest for late payment of the taxes would apply. But if you take advantage of this amnesty of a kind that has been proposed, then you and you file these taxes and pay under this regime, then it means that you have the advantage of 
not suffering those penalties and interest for late payment. Okay. The for which period is released. To the extent that it is up to December 2020. 20 years. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, George. So, uh, the last word from you, Prof, uh, rising debt levels. I, I, I can't even describe it any further. I mean, it's clear and obvious to everyone. Prof, what's your take on what's your advice to government? Yes, I think that um, um, that is a big concern and, and some of the tax measures that we are talking about, um, is the outgear towards trying to decelerate from where we are now. And, mm. and, and Prof, you may want to speak up a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I was saying that government is fully aware. If you look at some of the tax measures in the 2020, 2021 budget, the RGH was trying to decelerate from where um, uh, we are currently. And, and I think three things have shaped the current debt stock that we see here. The energy crisis that intensified from 2012 to 2015. Okay. Mm -hmm. Our attempt to resolve that manifested explicitly in debt formation. Then the financial sector crisis in our attempt to resolve it also manifested explicitly in debt formation. Then the pandemic and the containment measures, you can also see that they also manifested explicitly in debt formation and all of that. So, and then also over the period, over the period, some level of inefficiencies, you can also trace that to that. But you see, the problem is that the size of our economy has been increasing. And, and there's, there, there's, there's established theory supported by empirics that your revenue generation should also increase correspondently. Yeah. But you realize that even though our GDP has been increasing, we've done rebasing, captured new trends, we have not been able to expand our revenue envelope consistent with the size of our economy. Okay, And even when you recognize differences in how the tax is captured in, in what we call tax efforts compared to our peers, you realize that Ghana's tax efforts it's, 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 it's arguably one of the lowest in South Sudan Africa. Okay, so what that tells you is that Ghana actually has a potential to scale up on tax revenue collection without burdening the faithful few. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what that means. Okay, so, so, so what do we do then to scale up? So if you look at VAT without even the increment, Ghana's VAT efficiency is, 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 is low compared to our peers. Okay, and, and the explanation there is as a result of ex unrationalized exemptions and all of that. Okay, then you want to also talk about other tax handles. So, so what it means is that, that there is potential for us as a country to increase our revenue envelope without burdening the faithful few. And we should look at that approach. Look, theoretically, and when I say targeting, it's not as though we don't have some target. And I'm sure maybe if we check the last five years or so, GRA would have exceeded their, their target. And the question somebody reasonably will ask is, what kind of target is that? Okay. Here you are a country, your tax effort is one of the lowest uh, relative to the size of your economy, and you could actually generate more. And the major revenue generating agency exceeds its target. Somebody who questioned that target, we have to look at it again. And then also, when you look at our theoretical tax frontier, okay, our tax pot uh, uh, potential in, or captured all the variables, Ghana should be doing close to 24% of our GDP. Okay, so even now, when we put all our total revenue, including grants, it's less than 17%. Okay, so so we, we should be we should be intentional at closing that gap gradually, okay, by exploring efficiency and roping in uh, those who are outside, okay, and then more importantly, blocking the leakages. Look. individual pockets okay in, in 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 this country and that is that is not good when it happens that way then you realize that uh, in our attempt to 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 contain all these things then we are going to burden the faithful few the effect of the rising debt is already obvious which you talked about that that 2021 the biggest expenditure item is interest payment it's, it's likely somebody will look at that and say look this is a budget for investors not for private sector Okay, because they collect more to, to, to give to investors as return on their, on, on their uh, uh, investment in Ghana government instruments. Okay, but that is the reality. It's not like government doesn't know. 
Okay, but the point is that if you're able to increase generate more revenue and you even set aside 36 billion CDs for interest payment, you still have quite a lot to contain compensation and then other year mark funds, uh, uh, and, and then you have a sufficient for capital spending. Okay, so all these things we I believe that government is looking at it, and, and I like the idea that government is looking at uh, maybe up to 2024. But let's bear in mind that even when the fiscal responsibility act came into force 2018 going 2018 year and 2018 if we had included the financial sector bailout and energy sector bailout we wouldn't have been able to comply with the five percent threshold yeah okay so yeah. that that tells you that there are real challenges that we need to be we need to deal going forward and i think government has the incentive now why am i saying so government has a four-year mandate we know that in an election year, tax compliance is a bit low because you won't vote. Now that that is cleared, I think government will have to engage and then be a bit... Uh, uh, and, and, and the reason I'm happy also is that if you look at the philosophy of this government, they believe in the private sector. Okay, private sector-led economic transformation yeah. and all of that. So I believe that I, I also take um, consolation from what the Honorable uh, Deputy Minister said, that um, they would engage. Greater en engagement is very, very important. Less surprises, because people, okay. people uh, <laughs> like a comfortable environment. Okay. And I, I sympathize with government also. These are challenging times. Yes, very difficult times. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. I think at this stage, uh, so thank you very much, Honorable Abna Osea Sare, MP Etiwa East. Thank you, Prof. Bokken. Thank you, uh, Seth Chuma Pabwa, CEO, AGI. And then our uh, very own uh, John Owa. Thank you for joining us on this panel. And last but not the least, George Kuma, our tax expert. So that's the end of the panel discussion. I will hand over to our country managing partner to uh, give his closing remarks. Thank you all. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and again, let me add my voice to Yao. Uh, it's been very uh, exciting and very engaging. And you can see the comments that are coming, uh, that this is something that will not end um, now. Uh, what we are looking for is this that I've started. Um, one word that I heard so many times is that there has to be a lot more engagements um, uh, going forward. And that is what, as a firm, we have started. And we'll be doing that. So there are a few other recommendations based on all the discussions that happened. There are one or two recommendations that already the team um, have talked about and we'll try to package them and deliver them um, to the government. So one of the things on uh, after in particular, and I think uh, Prof and a lot of uh, you talk about it, uh, we are asking government to support businesses, especially around value addition. So, it's, so government should be specific and um, directed at value additions when we are even looking at the taking advantage of the um, after. Again, um, we talked about expenditure and uh, there's the expenditure that drives the debt levels. So we, what we are asking is that uh, government should monitor their expenditure, especially around recurrent expenditure, expenditures that do not lead to investments that will generate returns in future. So we are asking government to watch um, their spending in that side. The other one is the debt burden, and I think uh, we've talked about it, and we do not want to over emphasize that but again government cannot uh, operate without borrowing uh, but what we asking government is to look at other sources of uh, funding and um, they are uh, comparatively cheaper sources of funding that government can consider and i'm sure that these are things that uh, the ministers who will, will look at that uh, this will help to at least to manage um, the debt stock and then the repayment in the medium uh, to long term. In terms of uh, tax and regulatory issues, so we have just about two, uh, two or three points there. Um, and then we talk about government trying to mobilize um, these taxes. Property rate system um, should be improved. Um, our recommendation is that is it possible to move that 
um, to GRAs, for GRA to be responsible um, for the administration of property rates. And, and so that we think that could probably be one of the game changers. Um, there's still opportunity there for a lot more taxes to be collected. I think Prof talked about the uh, VAT systems and um, making sure that these systems are made electronic, digitalization of the revenue administration system, implementing the Fed, which uh, the Fed which was approved in 2018. I think it's time that the government consider implementing that. And last but not the least, um, if we are going to take advantage of after, uh, then we are asking, and Prof talk about it, uh, informing the curricula of uh, the education system. I think we need to look at French language and the literacy in French, because when you look at the African demography, you will see that we have um, a lot of French-speaking countries around. If we have to trade with them, we need to go back and look at it um, so that we introduce and make sure that that becomes part of the the curricula, especially from our junior high to our senior high school. So we, we are going to um, get together some of these recommendations and we'll put uh, together. Once again, let me thank uh, the panel. We have actually taken a bit more of your time. Um, we, we appreciate your patience to be with us. And, and our audience who has asked questions, we are going to pull all the questions the ones that we haven't been able to answer, we'll try to answer those questions and we'll share it with, with you. If you can leave your email addresses through your registration process, and uh, we'll share um, answers to all these questions with you. I, on behalf of the uh, partners at Deloitte, I want to thank first um, the Minister of Trade and Industry, Honorable Alan Chermatin. Again, I want to also thank uh, Prof. Um, Borkins also. Uh, John, our good friend, thank you for always being there for us. Um, Seth, as you know, we, we have been working together, but thank you for making the time. And um, Honorable, thank you for making time to be with us. We know there are discussion of the budget going on in Parliament, but for you to spend this time, and this is part of the engagements that have started. George, Gloria, Yao, and the partners and everyone that have been part of this, thank you very much. I hand over back to Gloria. If you're on the call, Gloria, take over. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much, everyone. At this point, we wish to officially launch the Deloitte report on the budget statement. Um, the barcode will be shared on the screen for people to capture. Again, we would encourage all of you to visit our social media handles uh, to download copies. If need be, you can get in touch with us and we'll send copies by email to you. Again, thank you very much and do follow us all the time for general and regular updates. As we earlier said, we value your feedback and input. So a link will be shared for you to provide us your honest feedback on today's discussion. Thank you very much.